We're recording. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you once again for participating in the June Marine Fish Advisory Commission business meeting. Uh, I, I can't tell you how happy I am to see commission members actively participating. Uh, this is new to me, even though we've been together for a number of years, I've been on the commission quite a while and uh, I'm astounded at the participation. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for participating. So we'll get right into introductions and announcements, review and approval of the June 3rd business meeting agenda. Need a motion? I would just make a note that the commissioner will not be attending today, so there will be no commissioner's comments under 2B. Okay, thank you, Jared. So getting back to a motion for 1A, gentlemen, review and approval of the June 3rd business meeting agenda. A little here, move to uh, approve. Second, Suki. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you, Suki. All those in favor? You want to do this by humanis, unanimous consent? Okay. No objections to raise hands? Or is anybody opposed to the business meeting agenda? Seeing no opposition, approved unanimously. Thank you. Review and approval of the April 15, 2021 draft business meeting minutes. Need a motion or if he has some corrections to be made, so air it now. Not seeing any uh, actions for corrections to the minutes. Okay. Is motion there... to approve. Who's that, Bill? Yes. Bill Doyle. And I need a second. Shelly, second it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Shelly. Is anybody opposed? Seeing no objections, April business meeting minutes will be approved as presented. Thank you, Jared. Uh, moving on to comments once again, I wanna thank the entire commission, all the members for their participation. And if you've been following your emails, we might be back in person by the September meeting. Uh, I know August right now is tentative, I guess. That will probably be virtual, uh, but Jared could fill us in on what he's hearing on a state level uh, about in-person meetings. And I'll move right on to the director. Hey, Raymond, could I invite law enforcement to uh, go before me? By all means. All right. Officer Kevin Clayton. Kevin Clayton, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Um, bring everyone greetings on behalf of Director Santos and Lieutenant Colonel Moran and the rest of the LE personnel. Um, uh, of late, you've probably heard some rumblings and saw some stuff about uh, some interactions, unfortunate interactions between some uh, private citizens and the tribe over some herring issues. And we're, we're, we're part of that conversation with the tribal law enforcement and some of the municipal, municipal law enforcement uh, chiefs uh, as they may uh, have um, need of exchange of information. Uh, I did wanna uh, highlight a couple of cases, although we're starting to, with the seasonal, um, the seasonal rise of, of arrival of fish and, and as you'd imagine, things are starting to pick up for us. Uh, on, on May 5th, uh, out in on Route 95 South in Rowley, I think it's Rowley, at the way station, an officer issued a citation for a Chapter 80 permit violation. And on that same day, about 11 p.m. at the Charlestown Navy Yard, there was a river herring citation issued. On the 15th, at the Lawrence, Lawrence Dam, there's a river herring issue. On the 16th, uh, at the Amelia Earhart Dam in Somerville in the Mystic River, uh, uh, some citations issued for river herring related problems. Uh, uh, on uh, the 22nd in Lewis Bay in Yarmouth, uh, there was an issue with uh, some short scup and striped, striped bass and uh, about 300 pounds of, actually is uh, Lieutenant Bass on?
I'm not saying him on. Okay. Um, he was involved in a in a in a um, in a seizure at Lewis Bay of uh, over 300 scup seized, on 300 pounds of scup, and um, on a closed scup day, and some donations were made to local uh, non-governmental organizations. On uh, 528, uh, there was a um, an officer, the, the sergeant assigned to the vineyard actually. Uh, was involved in recovering a couple of bags of fish that someone let loose and about 20 taut hog in the bag and seven black sea bass of um, multiple um, sublegal lengths were in were there were found therein as well. So things are picking up for us and um, it's just we can expect it's going to mount considerably as the days progress. Does anybody have any questions or anything for us? Any questions for Officer Clayton from the commission members? Not seeing any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Officer Clayton. Thank you, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Moran is expected. Again, he's delayed with another um, meeting. Thank you all. Thank you once again. Moving on to Director Dan McKiernan. Are you ready? Hey, to yep, thank you. Thanks everybody. Um, welcome to today's meeting and I wanna echo Ray's uh, uh, thanks to you all for your participation. Um, John Lennon said, uh, you know, life is what you do while you're making other plans. And uh, so some of the things that I wanna talk about today, uh, you know, obviously wasn't on my, uh, some of it wasn't on my to-do list necessarily as a priority when I became director, but some of these issues are really uh, consuming us these days. First of all, uh, right whales, as is typical of the aggregations in early May, the whales left the area in a matter of days from May 6th to, to May uh, 13th. Uh, we basically went from uh, almost 40 whales uh, between Plymouth and Provincetown to zero and subsequent flights uh, east and north of Cape Cod showed the, that no right whales were remaining in the area. And as promised, uh, we did open the fishery uh, two days early or as many days early as we could uh, if the whales left and they did. And so I know a lot of, um, of the fishermen were, were pleased that we were able to do that. Uh, the Endangered Species Act litigation beginning next Wednesday, June 9th, and for the following 12 business days through June 24th, uh, will be in federal court as defendants in the Strahan litigation. Uh, this litigation is consuming a lot of staff time and in, in mine in witness preparation, uh, securing and researching documents. Uh, we've been asked to go to find documents going back to when I first started um, at DMF up in here in Boston, as well as uh, some of the earliest litigation documents in 1996. So it's been, it's been very consuming. Um, and uh, I have to say that uh, you know, one of our attorneys warned us when we, we opted to go to trial, he said they call it a trial for a reason, and it's, it is arduous. Uh, there are no less than seven uh, really talented and dedicated attorneys working on our behalf for the Attorney General's office, as well as the General Counsel at EEA and two from the Department of Fish and Game. So we really have uh, a great legal team working on this. And that issue is DMF's uh, issuing of lobster and gillnet permits. And then the issue of vertical buoy lines that can entangle endangered whales and leatherback turtles. And I intend to make myself available every day that the trial is in session, um, which means, you know, it's, it starts at nine. The judge, I think, forecasted we would go like uh, up till lunchtime. So maybe it's like a one or one thirty break, a stop for the day, and then we resume. Uh, they might go to all day sessions if she's not making the progress that she wants, but she is putting a hard stop on 12 days in the court. Um, given my 25 years of dealing with this issue and with dealing with the plaintiff, um, you know, I, I think my presence is, is really valuable to um, make sure the record is, uh, is accurate. You know, if there are claims made uh, that, you know, at least in, in a lot of the documents that we don't agree with. And so we're going to make sure that it's all clarified on the record. Um, meanwhile, uh, you know, I, I do also want to point out Bob Glenn uh, has stepped up and filled the role that I used to 
Phil there, you know, dealing on the front line with the legal team and with the litigation. And uh, he's been really great. Uh, the, the, the legal team especially is appreciative of his expertise, uh, his efforts and his dedication and his demeanor. He's really, uh, he's, he's really been great for the lawyers to deal with. He's, he's really uh, been very professional in all of this. Uh, meanwhile, the so-called biological opinion was issued by NIMS, and it's a key part of the management strategies going forward and is central to this litigation. In the biological opinion, it maps out the need for routine, routine reviews of future serious injuries and mortalities of right whales, um, as, as well as other species. But let's face it, right whales is the central focus for us. Um, and if entanglements continue, then more risk reduction uh, is going to be required uh, you know, in the future, um, if if there isn't, uh, or if the the serious injuries and mortalities decline, then things may be better. Things may be different. Uh, but right now, it's kind of scary. You look at the biological opinion, and Bob can touch on this when he gets into the ITP issues a little bit. Um, you know, uh, if things don't change between here and Canada, uh, there's going to be more and more ratcheting down of of, of the fixed gear fisheries. Uh, but um, I'm optimistic that with all the rules that we've enacted and, and that will be enacted federally, um, we, will, um, we, we will not see that sustained level of mortalities. So today, this commission is, uh, is scheduled to take a final action on buoy line marking uh, regulations. And this is a really important rule, believe it or not. Um, it's, it's a pain in the ass for a lot of the the industry members, and we understand that. Um, but at the at the end of the day, or at the end of the analysis of serious injuries and mortalities in the future, with really um, con like a complex set of buoy markings, if we can attribute the the line that's on these endangered whales or, or and, and, and leatherbacks um, to the fishery of origin, um, and if it's not us, then I. Think to some degree we can get a pass, uh, you know, if the if the trends are consistent. And so, I think that's the game in the future is is delineating uh, the the origins of these ropes, um, so that we don't need as much broad brush approach to uh, conservation and and further risk reduction. We can be more surgical. Um, the risk reduction, uh, according to the to the modeling that, that Bob uh, you know, gets from the National Marine Fishery Service. It's called the decision support tool. Uh, they've estimated that be, everything we've done since 2015 has resulted in between an 85 and 95% reduction in the risk of serious injury and mortality. And uh, we're really proud of that. And we're hopeful that this um, is recognized by the court and, and by the take reduction team in the future. Uh, the next issue I want to talk about is uh, wind development. Uh, I am many of my staff have been spending uh, a ton of time with uh, coastal zone management staff dealing with offshore wind development issues. The latest is a wind farm on a small area known as Cox's Ledge, southwest of Martha's Vineyard. And one of the biggest challenges we have is calculating the level of fishing effort and the footprint of wind development locations, as well as projecting and forecasting the impacts on fishing generally. Um, but the possible displacement of fishing to other areas. Uh, the biggest shortfall is the lack of accurate and precise data about fishing activities for some sectors, notably the lobster fishery uh, and the charter and party boat fishery uh, is on the commercial side and the recreational private boat fishery. So today we're actually sending out uh, at the request of uh, CZM and also the wind developers, we're sending out a questionnaire, and I, I just saw it flash on the screen uh, that uh, Jared had put up. Uh, we're sending out a, uh, a survey, um, and, and Mike Pierdenock has been helpful in helping us devise this as well, to the charter captains uh, in the South Coast and Cape Cod areas to um, tell us, you know, how, off, how often are you fishing in, this, in this, uh, the footprint of this proposed wind area? Uh, I is the map uh, so anyway so here you can see the survey coming up on the screen you know if, if a if an operator has more than one vessel he's going to list the number of trips or he or she um the name the number of trips and then uh also the number of trips within that um that wind lease area down on cox's and um 
I don't know if the, we have a, a chance to get to that map. There it is, great, thanks, Jared. So you can see that little rectangle um, is the wind lease area. It's the proposed site of this, uh, I guess it's like 15 or uh, maybe it's 18 uh, turbines. Um, you can see that it's, it's blown up there in the lower right-hand corner, uh, but it's a small area and it's really challenging to to attribute uh, fishing to that area. I know a lot of the charter boats, uh, they may go there uh, you know, for part, part of their trip, or uh, if they are going there and filling out a VTR, what are the chances that the position they place is right on the ledge? Because in a VTR, you only need to put in one position for the day. So it's really challenging. And um, I, I really think that this is a, a really pivotal moment for fisheries management. Um, I really think that we need to um, develop uh, Im improved tracking systems for these uh, underrepresented sectors. I think the lobster fishery um, is, is uh, underrepresented in these discussions because uh, while uh, scallopers and groundfish boats have vessel monitoring systems, the lobster fishery does not, you know, and the charter boats do not. And, um, and not only is, it, uh, is the wind development going to potentially displace some fishing activities, but aquaculture, including offshore aquaculture, could as well. Uh, there's a, a proposal for a, a steelhead salmon, I'm sorry, steelhead trout uh, farm um, east of the Merrimack River mouth, uh, just south of the Isle of Shoals. And, you know, when it comes to trying to figure out who's fishing there, we have the same problem. You know, it's, it's really, really difficult to, to delineate and to calculate like how much is going on in those locations. So I, I, think, I think this is gonna require a lot of work and a lot of cooperation from fishermen that might, whose first reaction might be, I don't wanna tell the government what I'm doing. I don't wanna show them where I'm going. We have to assure them this is all gonna be kept confidential. But um, I think it is a, a threat uh, to, to these other poorly documented fisheries. So um, I'll stop there, but I, I think this is something we need to continue to uh, get ahead of. Uh, and shell, uh, last issue I have here is, uh, is shellfish. We completed the Massachusetts Shellfish Initiative strategic plan in May, and we participated in a press conference to describe it. Uh, the next steps uh, in the process are, is a formal establishment of a shellfish advisory panel by the legislature. We have a shellfish advisory panel now, but it's ad hoc and it's basically something I created. But I think for the for the future, it's warranted to have a, a formalized one where the, uh, where the participation is better defined and there's a mandate to, to meet periodically. The legislation that, that uh, has been enacted as an outside section of the budget calls for two, at least two meetings a year and uh, 15 named um, seats, including some, some from uh, other agencies as well. And so we are watching that closely uh, to see if the uh, final budget would have that. I really hope it does. We were instrumental in devising that panel language and we're really hopeful the legislature will give it to us. Um, and then uh, finally, the, the port profile project that Story and I uh, worked on uh, over the last year and a half, uh, along with uh, well, UMass Boston did most of the work. Uh, Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance also uh, played a large role, uh, Seth Rollbein, in terms of the the um, the the development of the document and the uh, and some of the editing. But uh, it's done. Uh, the frustrating part is that it only goes through 2018, so the the landing state are a little bit dated. We plan to update the statewide tables um, in a more frequent uh, level. We don't have to wait, uh, you know, two more years to to produce those those tables, but. It does give you a sense of the scale of all the state's commercial ports. Obviously, New Bedford comes out as number one um, because of the, the skull fishery and also all the infrastructure they have. But every port that has some level of commercial fishing, uh, we try to include in the document. And we hope that um, the document results in uh, local officials uh, being more uh, mindful, more uh, sympathetic, more interested in the commercial fishing activities, both uh, the, the commercial fishing itself, but also the, the for hire industry, which is a form of, uh, uh, of commercial activity with fisheries. And so um, there's a number of recommendations that are made in that. And uh, I know the legislature is interested in it. And we're hoping that a document like this 
uh, paves the way or, or helps a municipality um, achieve their goals in terms of uh, making grant applications and, or, or just justifying the, their own um, internal spending uh, for, for uh, improved commercial uh, infrastructure. So that's, that's a lot. So uh, I'll stop there. I'll take any questions, Ray, if anybody has any. Commission members, anybody have a question for Dan McKeon, for the director? Mike Pierdenock. Michael, you're recognized. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Dan, I, I would just like to thank you, Matt Ayer, Mike Armstrong, and your entire staff for working with us to address the wind turbine questions and concerns and so on you could have your entire staff dedicated to that and there still wouldn't be enough time it's a it's a monstrous uh amount of work that's that's just the tip of the iceberg as you know and i thank you for for helping us with this survey and trying to get good numbers greatly appreciate it thank you you're welcome mike um yeah we do uh hope to add a staff member whose prime responsibility would be uh, being the, the point person on some of these uh, wind development issues going forward. Thank you, Dan. Questions for the director? All right, Dan, I have a question when it comes to these uh, right whale aerial uh, state surveys, you know, the state aerial surveys. Is that all documented? Do they actually photograph uh, the whales in Cape Cod Bay and our state waters? Uh, just in a sense for the courts. So we can call on the Center for Coastal Study or whoever's doing the aerial surveys and, and bring them in the court and say, look, these whales were in our waters and they left our waters with no entanglements, no gear hanging off, no line. Uh, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, but would that help our cause at all? Yeah, Ray, uh, the whales are routinely photographed and... Um... And certainly, I don't think anybody doubts the the, um, the accuracy of our surveys. I would mention that um, the, the two entanglements that we've had over the last 12 years uh, were actually happened during the the, the, not, the, the off season. Uh, it was actually September both times. Those were both non, um, non-lethal entanglements. Uh, the whales were disentangled and it's all good. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, Center for Coastal Studies does an incredible job. I mean, imagine sitting in that small plane for up to eight hours. Uh, I know they, they do like to land and, uh, you know, take a, a break, you know, but uh, some of those flights can be as long as eight hours. And when you're photographing over 100 whales, you're doing a lot of circling. And I can tell you that, that my stomach couldn't handle that. But um, but they've been great. And, and their data is widely accepted. And I don't think that that's going to be a key part of the of the litigation. I think it's it's about like future entanglements and, and whether the our seventeen hundred pound uh, breakaway ropes are going to be adequate um, and whether or not the the approach we've we've taken is adequate. Uh, I believe it is, um, and we hope to prove that. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Oh, and the other thing is Ray, and you, as you know, uh, we did a, a show on WCAI, uh, and I, I believe uh, there was. Uh, there was a lot of good feedback from that. Uh, in, early, in late April, early May, uh, I was interviewed along with Stormy Mayo and, and uh, three lobstermen. Uh, they, I thought they did a very balanced piece. WCAI is the Cape Cod uh, NPR station. And uh, they had a, a, a live interview with a bunch of us about like, what's going on. And uh, I, I believe Jared sent you all that um, that link for the for the recorded radio show and if you haven't had a chance to listen to it I, I think it would be valuable yes i believe jared sent that out and asked commission members to view it and i'm sure as studious as this question is uh, the members did review it okay i guess we're going to move into action items if we, we have another comment, comment from khalil thank khalil, you jared uh, you recognize khalil thank you mr chairman uh Jared, can we go back to that slide of where the uh, wind turbines would be going? Yeah, just give me a moment. Okay. So Khalil, that, that is just one of seven uh, projects that is slated for this, what's called the Mass Rhode Island Wind Area. 
And this is the, uh, it's only one and, it's, and it is the smallest, by yeah. the way. Yeah, understood, understood. Yeah. I re I'm remembering back to a spring meeting in New Bedford where we, we had a person from uh, Cape Wind or someone come in and speak to us about it, talk to us about, talk, um, believe me, and I'm, a, I'm a firm believer of clean energy, uh, any way we can get it, but sometimes there are limitations and, and uh, there should be some thought about where things are going. And there was a lot of talk. I mean, we're talking 18 there, and then there's going to be another 18 somewhere else and another 18 somewhere else. Uh, and we talked at that time about the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the length of time these, these wind turbines would be going into a, uh, the length of, uh, the, uh, what am I going to say, their uh, length of existence, I guess, or how long they're going to last. And I think they, someone said 20 years or 25 years. What, what, is the, what is the impact? Uh, apparently, if we have wind, wind turbines in all those areas out there, and I see some channels there, some uh, channels for uh, boat traffic, uh, how is this going to affect? I mean, I know there's going to be transfer stations somewhere on the mainland. There's going to be a lot of cables underwater. Uh, and I know that I'm, I'm, I'm talking in generalities, but back then we talked about, back at that meeting in, in New Bedford, uh, how this is going to affect uh, trawlers, draggers, uh, fishermen, commercial, uh, recreational fishermen with all these turbines. Uh, Homeland Security is not going to allow, allow within a certain uh, amount of uh, space. And as, as Michael said, it's a monstrous uh, undertaking. Uh, is, this, is this a done deal that these turbines are definitely going to be going in there? I don't want to speak for, for the federal government and for all the parties involved, but um, like I know Cape Wind is, is approved and this one's next in the queue. I, I, can't, I can't forecast up or down. Likely it is going to go in. Um, as far as the impacts, that's, that's the issue that this um, fisheries working group uh, wrestles with all the time. And in fact, I will send you all uh, an invitation. The next fisheries working group is, um, I think it's, it's later next week. And that's when the state, uh, you know, CZM and DMF convenes a lot of the stakeholders and the developers, you know, in one room, of course, this will be one Zoom room, but um, to talk about these impacts. So, you know, one of the things that the wind developers agreed to a couple of years ago was to alter the uh, spacing to a full one mile and, and an east-west uh, or north-south-east-west orientation so that um, they're, um, you know, the, it's consistent. So from, from one uh, development to the next, the layout will have some, some consistent spacing. The, the challenge there is the, um, you know, it, it remains to be seen whether fishing can occur in there. As you say, you know, some, some people have forecast that Homeland Security issues may prevent fishing within the array, but um, that's not what the developer uh, claims. They don't have any authority over that. And, and uh, there are wind arrays around the world where fishing is taking place, uh, especially, um, you know, especially, you know, uh, rod and reel fishing, a bottom fishing, um, especially, you know, like, like they do around uh, oil rigs, right? It could create structure. So um, it remains to be seen, Khalil, and this is the big, the big unknown, and you know the, the developers are trying to come up with mitigation plans and estimates of the impacts on fishing. And there's very little agreement about what the future of fishing is going to be in these areas. Um, you know, some say there'll be almost none, and others say that you know you'll be able to fish as normal once they get erected. And others say, well, you can fish in there, but maybe the wind array is going to affect the fish negatively, and it's all speculation. So this is hard, you know, it's, it's this is a difficult issue. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you, uh, Dean, yeah. for that. Appreciate it. Mike Beardnock. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to add the uh, uh, Vineyard Wind is located at Gordon's Gully. That has been approved. They're going to be constructing it within the next two years. And there's an area the size of Rhode Island from Cox's Ledge to the Claw and basically Gordon's Gully all the way down to the dump where there will be wind turbines proposed. And as Dan indicated, there's multiple lease areas. 
They're presently in their initial permit process, uh, obtaining information as part of the EIS process uh, associated with uh, commercial rec and for higher use of those areas. So that, that's in its preliminary stages. I, I would just note that uh, NOAA, National Marine Fishery Service, as well as MassDMF and other state agencies have the same concerns we have. They presented them to BOEM, which is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which is in charge of this and regulates it. And BOEM is really the driver behind this. Uh, we're a bit disappointed that uh, our concerns and the concerns of the regulatory community are such that um, uh, those concerns don't seem to be heard and BOEM is still proceeding forward. These proposed areas go from this location all the way down to the coast of North, North Carolina. And um, maybe Dan next meeting or in the interim, uh, a, a chart could be provided that indicates the extent of these areas. So that, that's it, thank you. Yeah, yeah. sure. Michael, I have a question. Uh, Vineyard Wind Farm, which was proposed and I believe it was passed. What's that? Eighty turbines just south of Martha's Vineyard, and then that is correct. Yes, and uh, unfortunately, it is right in fruitful fishing grounds, which which most of these are right in fruitful fishing grounds for the four hire uh, rec commercial fleet, and it, it somewhat is logical because the the change in the depth and the upwelling that we find uh, productive fishing in those areas is what generates more wind. So if you moved it out of that area, <laughs> they're not gonna generate the wind they need to. So unfortunately it appears to be right smack in our productive fishing area. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe copses are, as long as I commercially fished, uh, that's a spawning area for uh, codfish. Correct, Ray. There's a lot of inconsistencies like that. We have areas of critical habitat. We have, uh, uh, um, as you mentioned, cod spawning areas. Uh, we have pelagics. We have a whole cross section, and um, there seems to be silence on that. We we suffer from lack of baseline conditions. Uh, these these are. I, they're going in and it's a matter of uh, how they will be constructed, what will the distances they will be apart so you can transit safely in and out of those areas, which is a concern, as well as safely fish within those areas. And, and that's what uh, is just one of the many problems. We could take up a whole day <laughs> discussing this, but that, that's kind of the quick summary. Thank you, Mike. One final comment to Khalil Ray. Um, I don't know if it, if it wasn't mentioned, but as you can see in the chart, this is a federally, uh, this is a project in federal waters. The fisheries are federally managed, yet it's the states that are being asked to estimate the activity of their state fleet out to that area. So that's really challenging because, um, you know, we're, we're talking about a bunch of rules that, uh, that are in multiple states fleets that are fishing out there. The other thing is, uh, Coeo, is this particular power is not coming uh, to Massachusetts or Rhode Island, but you can see on the, in the chart that blue um, dash line, that's the cable route, it's going to Long Island. And, um, and there'll be a buried cable um, underground uh, that hopefully won't, well, will be able to be fished over um, remains to be seen you know, in, in some places where they can't bury it if, they, if they're on ledge or something, then they have to armor the, um, the, the cable like covering it over with, um, with some heavy material so that it's not, um, it's, it's not exposed. So these are, the, these are the challenges, but I just wanted to, so, so here I am the director of DMF and I'm, and I'm working with our CZM and we're talking about how many of our state fishermen are participating in a federal federal waters fishery uh, in this in this one location. So it's really challenging. Thank you, Dan. Uh, you neglected to mention that uh, the cables from the, the vineyard project, they're running right up through Muskegon Channel, I believe in the Lewis Bay. I believe that's still the route for those cables. That's right, Ray, yeah. So, Mike Chernock, did you have another comment? 
Yeah, one last thing, uh, correct, uh, Ray, and also for the, the other ones proposed, the, those cables may be coming up through Somerset, um, where the old power plant, the coal plant's been fud, f shut down. Um, one thing for everyone around the table, as well as anyone listening in, uh, Orsted, uh, if you contact Orsted's fisheries liaison, and you as a captain want to understand the problems with transiting through these areas with radar, or vessel monitoring systems, they will put you in a virtual reality uh, situation. Uh, ultimately, it is a problem. Your, your vessel monitoring system as well as uh, radar will be interfered with. And uh, they're taking that, well, they're supposed to take that in consideration and what may ultimately happen uh, um, to address that is still undergoing discussion. But they're volunteering the captains that want to take part in that. They can call them, arrange to go in, and they can hook you up to a 35-foot vessel, a 65-foot vessel, or larger with the virtual reality, and you'll see the difficulties of going in and out of there during fog and so on. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other comments, questions for the director? I'm not seeing any, Mr. Chair. Okay, let's move on to the action item. And uh, the action item, uh, our format will be, Dan, the director will make the recommendation. We're gonna open it up to discussion before I ask for a motion. And then after the motion is on the board, we will come back to discussion. So every commission member has a clean and comprehensive understanding of the action item. So Dan, director. Thank you, Ray. Take it away. All right. So um, the commission will recall that that uh, we went to uh, to rulemaking back in December on a, a number of issues, and we got approval for almost all of them from this commission at the January meeting, and that included, you know, uh, expanding the closures and that seventeen hundred pound breakaway and all those other uh, standards. And we were doing this as um, anticipating the federal rules, which aren't out yet, but we're fully uh, expecting them to, to be similar and conform to those, but also as a means to improve our chances of getting that incidental take permit because we're reducing the risk in advance of our application. Um, one of the uh, issues that's coming out in the federal rules is going to be improved buoy line marking to allow uh, the, the for folks who take whale uh, rope off of whales um, to define the origin of those uh, lines. Like where, where was this line being fished with a, a lot more precision. And through this process, what we've, uh, we've determined is that uh, even the federal regulations were not as, as good as they, uh, proposed regulations were not as good as they should be to fully allow uh, the discrimination of Massachusetts state waters from another state and from the federal zone. So today's uh, proposal um, that we took to public hearing, um, you know, a, a month ago, uh, we didn't get too much feedback on it. And we have been working with the industry uh, as much as possible. Uh, today's proposal um, al allows us to uh, fully, um, delineate our state waters fishery from, even from, from gear fished by our fishermen when they step into the federal zone. And so we've gotten a lot of feedback on uh, how to make this practical. We understand it's a major hassle, but as I mentioned in my opening comments, this is the game of the future. It's, it's going to be to, to have gear as, as, as uh, benign as possible. And should an entanglement occur, to be able to exonerate the Commonwealth because of the, the detailed gear marking scheme. And so uh, what we have today is uh, proposals for state regulations for the uh, LMA 1, 2, and Outer Cape for state waters, distinct from federal waters, and distinct again from the federal waters of Area 3. And uh, Bob Glenn uh, and his team, uh, uh, Justin Wilson and uh, Aaron Burke and working with Jared to make this this uh, rule as 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 good as it can be, and also consulting with the National Marine Fisheries Service, have come up with these proposals. So I'd like to 
turn this over to Bob to, to talk about some of the nuances of this or and add, add to any of my comments about the need for this proposal. Yeah, thanks, Dan, and good morning, um, commissioners. Uh, th this proposal, in addition to the comments that just that Dan just outlined relative to its importance. One additional thing that's extraordinarily important about this is the need for the Massachusetts to be able to distinguish our fishery um, from all other lobster fisheries uh, so that we can be listed separately on the National Marine Fishery Service list of fisheries. Um, the, back uh, in January, um, oh, actually, let me back up a bit prior to that. Last year, the Division of Marine Fisheries provided comments to National Marine Fisheries Service on their annual list of fisheries designation, suggesting to them that based on our um, very conservative uh, management program to protect right whales, that they should list our fisheries separately. Um, in January, National Marine Fisheries Service published in the Federal Register kind of a response to our request and in their response, they noted that uh, while they, they agree that our, our efforts to protect right whales are extraordinarily conservative um, and in, in part distinguish us from other jurisdictions, they, they were not willing to in the last round list us separately because the characteristics of our gear were not sufficiently different to be able to distinguish us from the rest of the Northeast Mid-Atlantic lobster pot fishery. Um, and so we anticipated that, we kind of knew that, that that was going to be the outcome. And that is why um, we went through great lengths to, to develop these and, and, and kind of fast track them to the extent that we can. Um, and Jared really uh, did some heavy lifting to, 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 in, through the rulemaking process to get this um, in the queue uh, with Dan's guidance and um, you know, we present to you what we feel and what we've all already behind the scenes have vetted with National Marine Fisheries Service um, is a marking scheme that is sufficient to achieve exactly that, which is to um, distinguish ourselves as separate uh, and, and also um, to, to mark us our Massachusetts based fishing gear so that there's no ambiguity and that any entanglement case um, that doesn't have these two foot red marks, it'll be very easy to exonerate the Commonwealth and say, yep, that's, you know, we, we, we mark our gear with a, a two foot red mark every 60 feet. And if it, that line doesn't have that, um, that's not ours. And, and, and that's kind of at the heart here. Um, the reason for this advanced timeline is the fact that um, this typically in NIMS publishes uh, in September or October of every year their list of fisheries. Uh, and so it is critical for DMF relative to the success of our incidental take permit application that our fishery is listed separately as its own as the Massachusetts lobster fishery on the 2022 NIMS list of fisheries that'll come out this fall. Uh, and so the, the, the timeline of getting this done now and trying to get it uh, basically in our books by July is, is, is particularly intended so that um, when NIMS goes into their review of, of fisheries, uh, we'll have this in place and, they, and that'll be sufficient for them to make that designation. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Questions for Bob Glenn from commission members. Dan, did you want to add something? Um, yeah, I did want to just say, and I, I talked about the litigation um, earlier in my comments, but um, the judge, when she, her, she came out with her original ruling in April of 2020, ordered us to come up with an incidental take permit within 90 days. And what we learned and had to educate her was that unfortunately an ITP um, is issued after a couple of years of application because of all the work that has to go into it. But um, the, the, I, the, the application for and the receipt of the ITP is central to the litigation. And, um, and it, so, you know, Bob mentions the ITP, but I wanna link that back to the litigation where we are pursuing the ITP per court order. And, um, and we're pretty confident with the steps that we've taken 
that will be successful. Sharky? Yeah, thanks, Jared. Uh, Bob, I still am not clear on three-foot red mark at the surface system. Seems like Maine, maybe I'm wrong, is using that as like a trailer off the buoy. I'm not sure if this written, how it's written, is going to allow that and if that's the case or not. So when you when you say a trailer off the buoy, you mean like off a like off a toggle, Suki, or I'm I'm not sure about. Well, I, I think that maybe hooking them up on, you know, most people use swivels now on their buoys. They're just having a three foot piece of uh, uh, purple rope in Maine. I'm just talking about Maine, just attached to the buoy at that point, just trailing off behind the buoy. I don't think they're putting it as part of the buoy so buoy line, so to speak understand yeah I, I do um i mean the ours is basically it states that there has to be a three foot red mark somewhere within the first 12 feet of the buoy line and so i guess your question is is does uh some type of a trailer um count as the first 12 feet of the buoy line yeah yeah i i, I think we can you know make that that case that it does okay. I, I, don't know, I mean i i don't know that we need to specifically define that but uh, it would be as long as it's within uh 12 feet of the surface and this three feet of of red mark i it, it would it would satisfy the the uh the rules as written from my perspective they might i mean actually might be able to connect it you know for the two below below the buoy line so that would probably uh cover that part of it but i just not sure how they're doing it in Maine. And I just think this three foot mark should be as easy as possible to put in, not, you know, having to splice a three foot piece of red rope on the India buoy line somehow type of thing. That's all. I just hope that some kind of a trail system maybe can be used to make it a little bit easier for people. That's all. Thanks. Yeah, no, that, that's good. That's good input, Suki. And what I had kind of envisioned uh, as we move to next year when this becomes a requirement, much like we did with the week rope rollout, is we would have our gear people uh, work, reach out to industry members and work directly with them to come up with a, you know, a bunch of uh, alternative ways to satisfy this marking. And so we're, you know, we're looking for kind of cost effective ways um, so that fishermen can do this and also to provide federal waters fishermen kind of the flexibility to be able, or do, I'm sorry, duly permanent fishermen, the flexibility to be able to switch the necessary federal marks in and out as as required. So, um, you know, we're we're happy to work with with the industry, and and uh, we'll come up with solutions that are hopefully workable for everybody. Okay, Bob. Thanks. I just wanted to bring that up. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Suki. I have a question, Bob. So Suki's referring to a trailer uh, off the buoy itself. So that's your top marking. Uh, any ideas from industry, Suki or Lou Williams, on how you mark every 60 feet below that, the red mark? Are they talking about red tape, uh, paint, uh, or actually splicing this uh, breakaway red line? Any thoughts, Suki or Lou Williams? Yeah, uh, Ray, you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I guess um, what I'm hearing, I, I haven't rigged mine up yet, but um, the guys are using, putting in the three foot sections, you know, and uh, I've seen some guys, if they need more red marks, um, but I think I think the red foot's three sections, most guys are, are putting in and using those as their marks, you know, they're just splicing in every 10 fathoms um, to cover this, you know. Okay, thank you. And yeah. is there still this? This would be a question back to Bob. Is there still uh, this red line breakaway line available uh, at no cost to the lobster industry? Yes, we still have um, some inventory left right now. Uh, we, we just sent out um, a notice to all of our seasonal student lobster commercial lobster permit holders. Uh, their season opens June fifteenth, and we've set up. Um, three days at our Gloucester office and three days at our New Bedford office where those stu seasonal student uh, license holders can come 
buy and pick up. We're giving the students um, up to four coils of red rope, which based on some back of the envelope math uh, should be enough to cover enough for that for the average uh, seasonal permit holder to, to fit for to outfit all of their line because they, they're only allowed 25 pots. Um, and so we're, we're trying to set them up, but we do have additional um, uh, we both have red and candy cane line um, that we if, if anyone, you know, we were happy to arrange pick up for them um, at, at any time. So, yeah. And, yeah. and add to that, Mr. Chair, the, the, the we're working with the assumption that most of the seasonals will be fishing fully formed week rope as their entire buoy line, given their ex, their, their level of expertise and not wanting to require not wanting to have them splice in sections into their line uh, and the fact they were likely fishing singles. Thank you for the explanation. Thank you, Bob, uh, to you and your staff. Uh, you've done a hell of a job here uh, with the hire of uh, Justin. And uh, thank you for the information. So Blue and Suki, there is still red breakaway line available if you have lobstermen in your community who need it. Please shout out to Bob. And so more discussion on this recommendation. Yeah, Ray. Suki, you're recognized. The, uh, if you read the rules, the, uh, the red rope is going to be able to be a mark. So you won't have to add anks or marks in because you're going to put the, the red rope in every 60 feet anyway. So that's considered a mark. So it's going to be a dual purpose thing. You won't have to put tape on or weave anything in because you're putting a red piece of rope in there or some kind of breakaway. If you're using a different kind of breakaway, you have to do something. But if you're using the red rope or the candy cane rope, that's your mark. You don't have to add anything else. Right, right. Correct. Yeah, I follow that. I didn't okay. know I didn't know how apt the commercial industry was to this it, this entails a bit of splicing for everybody. So uh, you know, it's a lot of gear work in the winter shed. But yeah, I understood that as such. But for those who didn't want to, or who don't know how to splice Suki, you know, a lot of the younger guys, uh, you know, it's just a generational difference. You learn to splice the first day you started lobstering. But my fear is the younger guys, you know, and I was just curious as to how they were going to mark the lines if they weren't going to use this red breakaway line, splice it in. That's all. Well, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, but there's also a red tracer that runs through the South Shore sleeves, so those would also meet the um, red marking requirements. So who's that question to, Jared? Bob? The statement, I wanted Bob to correct me if I was wrong. Uh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, Jared, you're accurate. The, the the South Shore sleeves do have a red tracer in it right now. And so that would also count for those who chose to use the sleeves instead of the, the inserts. And then for, for folks who are using other options, um, you know, other will come up with things like, you know, fishermen have, have effectively used paint, uh, tape, uh, tracers, uh, heat shrink. There, there's a number of options that they can use to, if they need additional marks above and beyond or um, what they're already putting in with the with the weak inserts, so uh, we'll we'll work with them to to make those options available. Well, thank you, Bob, for being so responsive to the industry. Uh, more discussion on this recommendation from commission members, please. Bill Amaru, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Ray. I, am I coming in all right? I where I am at some Crystal clear, Bill. Oh, great! I'm glad to hear that. All right, so Bob, I have a question. I, I don't know whether or not I was awake and, or was dreaming when uh, I received a, an email from Noah recently announcing the use of ROVs to inspect underwater uh, these markings and different designations on buoy lines that are gonna be used that we're talking about right now. Uh, I was being facetious when I said that, that <laughs> there is a, a, an announcement, maybe everybody's seen it, from NOAA that they're going to be using underwater inspection systems. Uh, do you know anything about it? And, 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 and am I mistaken in thinking that that's kind of a pie in the sky approach to doing inspections, um, knowing how hard the tides run, what the limited visibilities are uh, for the areas where most of our gear is set? 
Yeah, Bill, that's a that's a good question, um, and I, I don't want to speculate too much. I, I am aware of it. I do know that they they did some prototype testing, um, and were able, um, at least in a few cases, to successfully take video of a buoy line. Um, but having done just a tiny bit of work with ROV systems, I can tell you that um, it's extremely labor intensive, and it's not a, a terrifically efficient process. You, you're not going to go out and check hundreds of lines a day. You're talking about maybe, you know, a dozen or less that you could with a, with that type of a system, because it's, it's very intensive to run. And then, then it gets even more so with, you know, in the Northeast, we don't have crystal clear water. We often have really murky water um, and strong tides, et cetera. So, um, you know, I, I, I think they're looking to try to find, um, they, they currently do federal no enforcement currently does not have a vessel that is capable of going out and actually physically hauling gear. And so I think they're trying to find some remedies other than, than buying a lobster vessel um, to, to, to be able to inspect gear. I believe that's what the, the, the kind of is at the heart of the issue. Oh, uh, I don't know. I seem how some of think buying a lobster boat or having people that can work with them be a heck of a lot cheaper than investing in ROVs and the support vessels and the scientists needed to run them. But that's neither here nor there for this discussion, I suppose. But I just wanted to bring it up uh, as another extremely out left field development that the government seems to be constantly coming up with, maybe somewhat stimulated by the stimulus funds that uh, have been talked about so much lately for uh, infrastructure rebuilding, et cetera, et cetera. All right, those are my comments. And I think everything else about the way this has been uh, handled and going forward is working nicely. The industry has been receptive and extremely cooperative. Uh, it's just gonna remember that there's a number of uh, additional operations that are gonna take place for every fisherman that fishes with ropes. And uh, please have the respect uh, in enforcement while these processes are getting underway to be uh, um, as lenient as possible while the fishermen are going through the learning process. Yeah, right, thanks, Bob. Thank you, William. More discussion on this recommendation. Mike Pernock. Michael, you're recognized. Thank you, Ray. Um, I'm happy I followed Bill. I agree with what he just stated. Um, I, I just, uh, and I'm happy to see that we're making or developing these measures to try to differentiate between what our our buoys or, and, and what are the buoys uh, or the, for associated with the traps from elsewhere. I, I still do pose a question and I think I said this um, months ago or a year ago or so on that it's it, it, as indicated, it's good to see that we're gonna have these measures. And then therefore, if we now see that there's a, a, a right whale that uh, is entangled or unfortunately dies in Massachusetts waters, but it has to do with a non-Massachusetts lobster trap. Does that right whale then go towards Massachusetts and not the state, which is the source of that problem? Because right now I believe it would hit the state of Massachusetts. I hope I made myself clear with yeah. your question, but Bob, um, do you want to take that, Bob Glenn? Yeah, well, thank, you. To. thank you. Yeah, so so right now, as as currently constructed, uh, the gear marking scheme in the United States isn't sufficient to be able to um, differentiate between jurisdictions with any great degree, and so what we end up with is is kind of unidentifiable rope, and so we can look at it and we can make some assumptions, like if it's five eighths rope, we're we're 100% confident that it didn't come from mass state waters because coastal fishermen don't fish uh, rope that large. But there are still detractors who would say, well, how do you know? You know, there, there are folks in the, in the conservation community who would say, well, you can't prove that. And so, um, but getting to your, back to your question relative to takes, how it works now is that uh, any take in, in the, just goes against um, the or especially in the case of it's designated as a serious injury or mortality, that gets attributed to uh, you know the the U.S. lobster fishery, that the the Northeast Mid Atlantic lobster trap fishery as it's classified. Um, moving forward, if Massachusetts is 
given it's, it's distinguished as its own fishery and we're giving our own incidental take permit, uh, we'll, we'll be given our own level of serious injury and mortality, our own, you know, so our own PBR essentially uh, that we're allowed. It, it'll be extraordinarily low. It'll be a fraction of what the total fishery is allowed in the biological opinion. Uh, but that said, in, in, that, in that case, uh, a gear that was say found in Massachusetts water that did not have um, the red markings on it to indicate that it's mass gear would not count against our, our serious injury and mortality. Uh, thank you, that, that's positive to hear. We're, uh, you know, it's evident that Massachusetts is taking significant measures um, and that, uh, that that's positive to hear. Thank you. Ray, if I could follow up with two comments uh, to Bob's point, um, you know, we had a case just like that this winter. We had a, a whale with five eighths inch rope, which is, as Bob said, not only uh, lar you know, larger than anything we fish, uh, but in the future will be larger than anything we fish legally because one of the rules you enacted with, uh, at our request was a three eighths inch maximum buoy line diameter for state waters. And so, um, so that's, that's really important um, uh, to remember um, that, that uh, we really want to identify that gear as much as possible. So um, anyway, so that, I just want to make that clear. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, more discussion on this. Not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair, if you want to move to motions. Yeah, let's move to a motion. I'm going to need a motion for this uh, action item. Anybody, somebody? Mike Piernak, motion to approve. Need a second. Shelley Edmondson, second. Is there any opposition? Uh, actually, Mr. Chair, with this one, we have to go by roll call. It's a regulatory item. Thank you, Jared. I'll initiate the roll call. Bill, Do Bill Amory. In favor, aye. Bill Doyle. I'm in favor. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Mike Peardnock. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Sookie Sawyer. Reluctantly, he is. <laughs> I, I believe it's unanimous. That's unanimous. Approved 8-0. I'll pull back up the agenda. We're going to move on to discussion items. Thank you for that vote, members. Incidental take permit application update. Director McKiernan, is, is this in your venue? Um, Bob, do you want to speak to that? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, first, though, I just wanted to quickly thank the commission for approving that. I, I, I know that this um, comes at a, at a large burden to the, the fishing industry and, and time, effort, and money. And, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's, um, unfortunately, it's, it's necessary in the current management scheme and the issues that we have with right whales. But I, I truly appreciate your, your engagement on this and your, your cooperation. It's really appreciated. And I'm confident it'll really help us um, in producing a, a successful incidental take permit application. And so speaking of that, uh, this will be really brief. Um, the biggest updates that I have for you is that um, through fun funding from the governor, um, we were able to add two new additional staff who specifically will be focused working on the incidental take permit. Those staff members, one of them will be assigned to our fishery statistics program because the incidental take permit uh, requires a, a, a ton of additional fisheries data analysis. We have to you know, present and describe each fishery and the risk associated with that fishery. And so the stats uh, program has hired Scott Schaefer. Scott is a, an analyst for, for DMF and he, he comes from the NOAA Observer program where, he's a, where he was a data debriefer and kind of an in-house expert on fixed gear fisheries. And so he brings a lot of experience to the table and will we'll kind of be our lead person on 
pre uh, on producing what, what it was going to be amount of, of data and fisheries analysis that we need to include in our, in our application. Uh, the second person will be a protected species permit specialist. Um, and that person, her name is Taylor Stoney. Uh, she started last week and I believe Scott started two weeks ago. Uh, Taylor just recently finished her degree from Duke, her master's degree from Duke University in marine policy, where she focused on protected species issues. And so she, she brings, um, well, although a new grad brings a tr tremendous amount of knowledge um, into protected species, the Endangered Species Act and Remember Protection Act, and she's going to be a real asset. And um, it's a real benefit to myself and Erin Burke, who are um, distracted with all other things re well related, including li litigation and just running the protective species program. We're hoping to you know, insulate Taylor from that and just really uh, isolate her and, and, and uh, have her focus solely on banging out the permit. And so with the actions that you've taken uh, through regulations, you've helped us develop what is going to be the baseline. Uh, we consider that the heavy lifting for the permit is now done because we've we feel um, that we've achieved sufficient risk reduction. As Dan mentioned in his opening comments, uh, you know we're we're between 85 and 95 percent reduction. Well, mathematically, that's where NIMS is hoping to be in 10 years, and and we're there by within six within the first fishing season. So. Um, our heavy lifting is done. I think we have a really strong justification to be able to to uh, get this permit. And uh, with these two new two new staff members, we're we're going to really be able to to buckle down and and actually um, get to the process of of writing this habitat conservation plan and, and take permit application, which is a, a big task. But we'll we'll um, we're going to bang it out. So uh, thank you. That that's that's my update. Yeah, Bob, uh, this is Ray Kane. You need to send a formatted letter out to all the ENGOs and repeat what you just told commission members in a letter form to all these ENGOs on what Massachusetts is doing to protect the right whales and hopefully protect the harvesters. Yep, uh, agreed. Thank you, Bob. Thanks. Any questions for Bob? I'm not seeing any hands, Mr. Chair. Okay, let's move it along. CARES Act relief update. Director. Yeah, Ray, Ray, I've got some uh, slides that uh, we produced and I'll, I'll run through those pretty quickly. I wanna thank uh, Maggie Nazarinas uh, and Kevin Creighton and, and Stephanie and the rest of the team for putting these together. So by way of background, the, the commission knows that um, last year we got $28 million in CARES relief when we um, got that money out faster than, than the other state. And uh, another round of funding was approved by Congress right after Christmas. It was uh, the same amount of money, but we got a little bit less because the allocation formulas were a little different. Um, some states got a minimum amount and there was also money set aside for some of the West Coast tribes. But nonetheless, um, this year we have 23 million, which is uh, you know, still a substantial amount of funds. Uh, just shy of the 28 from last year. So we want to uh, get this money out consistent with congressional uh, wishes before September 30th. And so we've convened the same set of industry advisory groups to, to team up. Um, and we've held uh, meetings of the aquaculture working group, the Fahari working group, the seafood processor working group, commercial fishing working group, and then the overall group of the uh, select members from each of the first four into an advisory panel. And all of these meetings are, are, are being summarized and their, uh, their meeting summaries are posted on our website. Next slide. Um, so in, in the first uh, round, we uh, received formulas from the National Marine Fishery Service or, or percentages where they told us uh, what went into the calculations and how if we were going to uh, reapportion the funds based on uh, what went into their calculations, uh, what those shares would be. Uh, we accepted those values, but we did uh, tweak some of the numbers. We, we took some money away from, uh, from the commercial sector and the, um, and the seafood sector, uh, the processing sector, and we moved it a little bit to um, the for hire and the aquaculturist because we knew then 
that the, the losses were much steeper in those two sectors, especially, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, oyster farmers uh, took a, one of the worst hits, as did the party and charter boats, especially with the travel restrictions. So uh, those two sectors, uh, we moved some money over to them. So in essence, what our idea for this time around is let's let's use those the same um, uh, allocations that we went with in round one, um, but retain about 10% of the money and, and put it in kind of a kitty. And what I mean by that is um, we really don't know at this point uh, what the relative losses are for each of the four sectors. Uh, we have an idea, but we don't have the, the data yet. And what we thought we would do is by retaining 10% of the money, um, we could uh, process all the applications and assess the losses per sector. And if we see much steeper losses in one or more sectors, we would give them uh, maybe a larger share uh, of that kitty. And so um, that's, that's our plan. Um, you can see uh, in the next slide, uh, Jared, you can see that our administration part of this is minimal. Uh, we're talking about um, just $49,000 uh, for, uh, for our end of the grant. And that's just to cover uh, part of an FTE and some administrative cost. The Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission will also be taking a small amount for all the work that they're gonna do for us uh, we're going to send them uh, eligible, uh, uh, you know, the, the list of permit holders who are eligible and the amount that they should be paid. And, and then they're going to cut the checks and, of course, the 1099s as well. Uh, next slide. So, so these are the allocations that we're anticipating. Uh, we're anticipating um, uh, seafood processors at 10.3, commercial fishing 8.8, .8, aquaculture is just under a million and for higher 750, and then that's set aside. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, what, the slight differences from, from, this, uh, from this effort compared to the last one, let's go to the next slide I'll just mention, um, is the period of loss. So what we learned in, in our dealings with the applicants is that um, and, and, and the statistics uh, bore this out that the worst losses were felt right after the pandemic hit and things got shut down. So March 10th, uh, month of March, month of April, month of May, and then things got a little better, uh, especially in the commercial fishing and the seafood sector. Once uh, fishermen, um, you know, figured it out or, or the dealers pivoted to different products. So um, what we found is that the longer some of those sectors um, you know, we're, we're still, um, you know, uh, in, in calculating, I'm sorry, the, the longer the period that we use to calculate the losses, the less likely it was at the 35% threshold of loss, which is mandated by the law, um, would be met. And so what we did last time is uh, we had different time frames for, for allowing each applicant to assess their, their losses and each, each sector had its own time frame. So specifically seafood processing went March to June, commercial fishing, we gave them an extra month through July, aquaculture same March through June and for higher March through June. Um, we, we cut those time periods off because we wanted to get the money out on the street um, as fast as possible, even though in some cases the losses did continue as the season went on, but we wanted to make sure that people were able to meet that 35% um, threshold. What we learned is that some businesses do, really did lose in excess of 35% um, during say the months of March and April and maybe May, but by June, they made some comeback and suddenly they weren't uh, eligible. So what we talked about with each sector is, what if we made everybody who, who got a check last time who was eligible would be able to reapply with, you know, based on that same eligibility, but anyone who didn't meet the 35% loss threshold uh, could apply uh, in the second round, but use a narrower time frame when the losses were deeper uh, for the sectors. So specifically uh, for seafood processing, uh, March through May, commercial fishing, March through May. Uh, aquaculture, we went much, uh, we went longer because um, some, while the losses were steep everywhere, there are some businesses that don't normally sell oysters in the spring. And in order for them to document their losses, um, you know, they needed to um, be able to use uh, the later months in the year as part of their look back of the previous five-year averages. 
And um, same for, for hire, you know, some, some guys, um, you know, maybe don't charter so much uh, in the period through June 30th, but it picks up after that. So those are the, uh, those are the ideas that we came up with and those were generally accepted uh, by the, uh, the industry uh, advisors. Next slide. The other thing that came up is, um, is sort of appeals. And, and the first thing we came up with was, you know, what if somebody got COVID? I mean, most of the proposals that we have here are based on the assumption that it was market forces that caused people to, or in businesses to lose uh, money uh, during the COVID year. But it dawned on us that if somebody actually got COVID and lost some time, um, that, that they could appeal that that time period, like let's say somebody came down with COVID in the summer months, they could use those summer months uh, or that month um, and, and use that as a look back to the previous five years uh, and that might make them eligible. Um, we don't think there's that many cases, but we thought that was a reasonable thing to do and, and, and could fit the narrative. And then the second was, uh, what, if a, what if there was a big, like a vessel breakdown uh, during the previous five years would fishermen be able to sort of, um, you know, like uh, eliminate that year or that time period from their five-year average uh, to compare the, the COVID year to the previous years? And we thought that that was a reasonable thing as well. So you know, if somebody's, uh, you know, in their five-year previous average, if they had one year, which was a real down year, then um, it sort of lowers the, the denominator uh, value such that the, the COVID year compared to the previous years, uh, the 35% threshold may not be met. So these are the, these are the uh, specifics that we intend to submit to the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, at the end of this week. Um, I don't think anyone else has, has their applications in yet. I do expect we'll get a quick turnaround um, because um, I think the NIMS folks are anxiously awaiting all the states to submit their, their documents. And um, they've been pretty uh, good to us in terms of getting uh, uh, responses back to questions. So we're, we're hopeful that uh, we can get this done. Um, I think the next slide has timing. Um, yeah, so these are, these are just some of the details. Um, you know, just like last time, you need to held a, a 2020 wholesale dealer permit. Uh, and in 2019, the 35% revenue loss is defined as, as the period, as I just mentioned. Um, for uh, seafood dealers, we, we need to have, uh, those businesses need to have made at least $100,000 a year. Um, and 70% of that has to be in the in, in fish, wholesale fish. Of course, in a minimum year of eight, uh, age of 18, uh, your permit can't be suspended or, or revoked from the, from the fisheries agency's mass resident. And of course, the big one is um, you can't be made more than whole. And so, which is interesting, and, and the staff have come up with great uh, ideas about how to, uh, how, to, how to use that more than whole concept. And what we're getting that there is um, if someone hits the ceiling, like if, if they would be in line for say a, a $20,000 payment, but it's, you know, the, in order to be made more than whole, they wouldn't be able to accept say more than 12. Well, the Delta, the $8,000 um, that they would have had coming to them gets put back into their sector um, for other fishermen to, to obtain through the shares. And so I think that that's a really creative way to, um, to sort of maintain the, the, um, the allocations per sector and, and also to use the data, you know, efficiently um, and, and appropriately because we have this, this kind of data uh, and we can back it up with our, with our safest system. Uh, I think the program has a lot of integrity and, um, and, and I'm really pleased about that. So um, I think, go ahead, the next, uh, next slide. Um, oh yeah, this is just more details on the commercial sector. Again, uh, we've got specific timeframes. Uh, if you did apply last time, you're automatically eligible. If you did apply and were successful, you're automatically eligible for a second payment. Um, and uh, if you didn't, then uh, you can come back with this uh, shorter application period. And of course, the more than whole uh, uh, matters. Um, we have a $15,000 uh, uh, threshold that if you need to have had at least $15,000 in fishing revenue from 
the previous three years before the COVID year. Um, and again, the, the more than whole kicks in. Aquaculture, uh, uh, same thing. Um, we, we have those two time periods. And uh, you know, why October 31st? We did get some analysis and also some feedback from the, from the members of the aquaculture uh, sector. And um, you know, I think oyster sales can be pretty slow. Sometimes they pick up in November, December, but it was felt that just by going through October 31st, we would get the maximum number of, of eligible participants uh, in the system. Uh, for hire, uh, we've got the um, same thing uh, as last time. You uh, have to have met a minimum threshold of for hire trips in 17, 18, or 19. Uh, that is 50 for the charter boats and 10 for the head boats. 35% uh, revenue loss during those two time periods, uh, one or the other. Um, and um, and again, the, the more than whole. So I guess in you know in the bottom line is by by using the data that comes in on the applications, we're going to be in a position to uh, effectively um, see how many members of the industry or the applicant pool are made more than whole, and how many are not. And I think that's going to help us uh, prevent people from exceeding that ceiling, but also reallocate money to others in the sector. So this is a slide that kind of shows the, uh, the, uh, the, the calculations where you can see the, uh, the, the, what the maximum payment was gonna be is you take your average of your previous five years, 15 through 19, um, and, and you subtract uh, rel relevant revenue, the, the CARES payment. So um, when it comes to being made more than whole, you can't, uh, you have to sort of credit the fact that you've already gotten some CARES relief. Um, other COVID-19 unemployment relief. So if you personally um, obtained uh, unemployment uh, during that time, you'd have to factor that in. Any other COVID related grants uh, that you do all that math and you come up with your maximum payment. So um, hopefully this is gonna be clear on the application and we'll have staff uh, ready to uh, meet with with individuals probably um, you know in our like maybe our North Shore office South Shore office for for people to do walk-ins and also be on the phone. We we had a lot of staff that all pulled together last time, and um, I'm sure we'll bring them all together again. So I I think that's it. Um, yeah, we, we're talking about workshops. Here's the here's your timeline. Let's go to the timeline slide, Jared. We've got. Um, we want to submit the spending plan this week. Uh, we want to mail the applications uh, in about four or five weeks, hold workshops in August, uh, get all the applications in by, by August, deal with appeals up until September 10th, and then um, do uh, all the final calculations uh, by the end of uh, September, sending the list to ASMFC. Unlike the last time, uh, when we did the four sectors sequentially, we plan to do them all at the same time. So nobody's gonna get paid till everybody gets paid. Uh, and, and taking this approach allows us to get all the applications in and know with confidence how much, uh, how much we're gonna be allocating to each sector. And then um, by calculating the, the payments with the so-called uh, not to exceed more than whole, we'll be able to pour that unused money back into each sector's uh, pool and, and reallocate it. So it's, uh, you know, this is probably gonna be the last one, uh, thank goodness, but uh, the staff are, are pretty experienced at this and we're, we're confident that we can get all this done by the uh, end of September. Okay. So I'll take any questions. Questions for the director. Khalil? Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Director. That was a that was really a very uh, meaningful uh, presentation. Uh, really outlined it very nicely. Jared, can we go back to the participant list uh, where it compared last year to this year? Stop me when you see the slide. Uh, keep going. That's the first one. Um, the one where you, you listed all the participants and who they uh, what they got last year and what they got this year. Oh, by sector. 
Yeah. This one, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe that's not the one. I saw. I saw on one of the slides. And I think it's really great that you know, even though we didn't get as much as we got last year, that we're able to do this. DMF is to be commended for what they've done with the CARES Act. Um, I'm just curious as to. Oh, there it is. Well, tribal participants. What does that mean? That's a good question. Um, so the language of the CARES Act talks about the impacts to uh, tribal ceremonies and, and um, Kevin, help me out with this, maybe subsistence fisheries, but not necessarily the commercial fisheries because all of our commercial permit holders who are tribal members would also be eligible to, to get payment for their commercial uh, activities. This particular case, uh, we had the Aquina tribe in uh, Martha's Vineyard come to us because they have a program where they actually invest uh, their resources in like hatchery work to bolster local production of shellfish for the public and including tribal members. And they requested from us if under the under the, the purpose of these funds and the fact that the federal law mentions tribes, they asked us if they could apply for uh, support based on uh, the impacts on, on that activity for reasons such as um, they weren't able to um, do as much uh, seed production because they separated everybody. And they, I mean, the, the, they have a hatchery and their employees were, couldn't come in because of the COVID. And so we put a value on that of the, the value of the seed they would have produced. And so it came out to around $5,000. So, so that's, that's one payment to one tribe based on one, one activity, as opposed to it going to many tribal members. It's, that's not the case. It was, it was a payment made to the Aquinnah tribe at $5,000. Thank you, understood. And uh, again, uh, great job. The director for well, you know, what you've done and what your team team has done to get this money out it really is incredible. Thank you. I have a question, Dan Ray Kane. Uh, Jared, can you go to the time reference table to the last chart that you had up? Is this the one you're looking for? The last one. Schedule. Schedule. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so I know you've got an executive committee at noontime today. Submit payment list ASMRC. I believe there was a drop dead date of September 30th for this money to be allocated yeah. and distributed. Yeah. So as long as we submit the list ASMRC by September 22nd, even if the, because I'm sure they're going to get inundated, even though like we were the first state on the East Coast to submit last time and approved. Uh, I'm sure the same thing's going to happen, and we're looking at September 22nd, and you're looking at what 15 states to submit. Yeah, Ray. Um, I don't think it's as bad as it as you as you think it is because I think NIMS has to part with the money by September 30th. So if their applications are are submitted, and and then NIMS gives the money to ASMFC, ASMFC can sit on that money beyond September 30th. No, I, I'm not feeling bad about it. It's just a point of clarity. I want to make sure that with the diligence that your staff has done, yeah. uh, that Noah understands that ASMFC might get overworked from September 20th through. No, I don't think so, Ray, because it, the, the September 30th deadline is for the money to be uh, sent from NIMS out and, and in our case, out means to ASMFC. So ASMFC could then sit on the money while the while the lists are being generated during October and November, and that wouldn't that would be perfectly fine under the, the guidance that we've received. So right. it's not like every recipient has to get their check by the thirtieth. NIMS needs to cut its check to either the state or the ASMFC by the thirtieth. Thank you, Dan. Any other questions? Captain Clayton. Yeah, hi. Um, had a question about the tribal component, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, is that a situation in which the tribe would have been able to apply independent of the state? 
seeing as they have federal recognition or is that? Yeah, I think it, it, from the West Coast perspective, there are tribal fisheries and tribal fishery management plans where, where whole stocks are managed distinctly by the tribe on tribal land or, or, or whatever. Right. I think that's, but that's not the case uh, here in the East where, where there are um, specific like tribal allocations. And you know what I mean? So um, like there are salmon runs and in, in, on tribal land that are exclusively, um, you know, okay. for, for the tribe, tribe's use. And okay. in Maine too, right? You've, I think you've got a tribal harvest of, of um, elvers that is that Maine does its best to uh, to manage and recognize. All right, that's helpful. Thank you, yeah. sir. Any more discussion on this? I'm not seeing any further comments. Then we are going to move along to uh, to astute uh, EMF colleagues uh, to discuss ASMFC, the outcome of the spring meeting and council meeting. So take it away. Nicola? Jared's gonna bring up a couple slides. Um, the ASMOC last met in early May. So I'll just give you a couple of the um, highlights from that. I think the, the biggest issue was Striped Bass Amendment 7 and the selection of the issues um, that went out to scoping earlier this year for continued development um, in the draft amendment. And it was really, um, uh, limited to uh, a several issues um, that the, the board really wanted to focus on, um, you know, rebuild, what's going to help rebuild the stock right now and, and uh, prevent further decline. So the issues that were kept in were the management triggers, conservation equivalency, and recreational release mortality. Uh, and the list of what was removed was much long, longer, the goals and objectives, the biological reference points, the stock rebuilding schedule, regional management, recreational accountability, and coastal commercial quota allocation. And then one new um, item was added in based on the public comment, and that was measures um, to protect the 2015 year class. So the, the PDT has begun its work to um, develop options for those issues and um, we're looking to um, approve a draft amendment for public comment in October. Uh, there'll kind of be a check-in and the progress of that in, at the August board meeting and um, still that would put us out to 2023 until implementation uh, of, the, of the amendment and any associated measures. Um, on Menhaden, uh, the, there was a discussion about commercial allocation, and there was a, an attempt to initiate an addendum that would look at reallocation of the co um, commercial state-by-state -state quotas, and that was postponed in order to have a work group formed that could, um, you know, really flesh out the, the issues more and why there would be a need for reallocation, and also to look at some of those associated provisions about the episodic event set aside um, and really the, the small scale fishery provision um, has been an issue that's um, gotten a lot of increased attention lately um, because of the, the scale of landings in, in Maine that are coming in under that provision. So that's something else that's gonna you know, get up, likely to get attention when an addendum is uh, scheduled to be initiated at the next meeting in August. Next slide. Um, so at the winter meeting, I, or and after that winter meeting of the ASMC, I, I told you about the final action that was taken on the commercial black sea bass reallocation amendment. And um, this responds to a you know, change in the species distribution and, and factors in um, the regional biomass distribution into the state allocations. And the final action also increased Connecticut's quota by 2% separate from the regional biomass um, element um, in uh, recognition of the fact that there's been an expansion of the stock into Long Island Sound that you know, previously didn't exist. And um, there at the time, when, when that was approved, New York had um, also tried to get that same 
2% uh, increase to their quota, given that Long Island Sound is a, a shared water body between those two states. Um, and that was voted down. So New York brought an appeal forward, which was discussed at the spring meeting of the ASMSC. And appeals go to the policy board. And um, New York was successful in making that argument that they um, you know, had not received the same um, treatment as Connecticut based on the same rationale of that expansion into Long Island Sound. So the, that decision has been remanded to the corrective, uh, to, the, to the species board um, for corrective action. And the, they're ne next gonna meet in August. And I think the, the even more interesting part of this um, because it's a joint managed species is how the Mid-Atlantic Council um, will deal with this um, because the allocations were newly adopted into the federal plan as well. And so if the ASMOC took a corrective action um, or changed the allocations without the council also doing that, there would be a mismatch um, between how quota closures are implemented in, in the states. So the council will be discussing this next week at their meeting on June 10th. And um, uh, the, the council staff is, is recommending that the council you know, reconsider that decision. And it'll be interesting to, to see um, how that goes given, I think some, some statements that were made at the ASMC board meeting where the, the chair of the Mid-Atlantic Council seemed um, not inclined to, to change things. Um, so that should be interesting. Um, next week, uh, there's also going to be uh, the, a joint meeting between the Bluefish Management Board and the Council um, to take final action on the allocation and rebuilding amendment. Um, so that looks at both um, commercial and recreational allocation and the commercial state allocations and um, picking a, a timeline for rebuilding the stock and um, associated uh, measures with that. Um, and then Dan will handle the lobster board. But before that, I also did wanna note that next week, just before the Bluefish Board meeting, there is a one hour presentation about the 2020 MRIP estimation methodology, um, which may be of interest to some uh, members because um, uh, you'll know, you know that MRIP sampling was um, interrupted a lot last year by COVID, particularly the, you know, the person-to-person -person, uh, headboat sampling or in-person headboat sampling, as well as the um, access point angler intercept survey. And so there'll be a um, presentation about how NOAA Fisheries dealt with those data gaps and um, borrowed, you know, proxy data from other years to help fill in the gaps for last year. And uh, it's interesting that, you know, if you, if you query the MRIP data now, it'll tell you, you know, how much data they had to borrow for each state's estimates. And, and Massachusetts fared pretty well um, because we only postponed the um, angler survey sampling until late May. And our, you know, recreational fisheries are relatively limited prior to that, um, exclusive, of, exclusive of some of the groundfish species. Um, and lastly, before Dan goes, I would note that the summer meeting of the ASMC is going to be virtual. And the, the, the hope and the expectation is that um, the meetings will resume in person for the annual meeting in New Jersey in October. Uh, before Dan comes on to discuss lobster management board, any questions for Nicola? Mike Piernock. Michael, you're recognized. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, three questions. Uh, okay. First, uh, as it relates to striped bass, the measures to protect the 2015 year class, can that quickly be summarized? If not, uh, if you could forward me details offline. What's your thoughts? Uh, it, that's to be developed by the plan development team. Um, but I suspect it'll be looking at things like the slot limit and whether the minimum size changes. Um, but we've the PDT has just had its first call and has many more before we come up with all the options that might be associated with that. But I can keep you in the loop. 
Okay, so that's that's more concept. I see. All right. I, I thought they were maybe talking environmental, but I, I see what you're getting at. Thank you. Uh, concerning black sea bass, I find it interesting that these other states uh, want to take into consideration expansion of the black sea bass into their waters, which is no doubt we've observed the same. So um, what, you think this is going to happen? And if so, uh, why then is not the same consideration being taken into account for Massachusetts? Um, so I, it, I think it is the, the, the initial increase to Connecticut has happened. Um, and, and part of the problem was that Connecticut only had 1% of the um, allocation previously and their um, you know, trawl survey really showed and, and their um, you know, landing showed that sea bass were not in Long Island Sound extensively before the last you know, 10 years. Um, and given the expansion in there, you know, they argued for this, this initial increase. Um, I think Massachusetts is a little bit different in that there were sea bass here, certainly not in the uh, abundance that they are now, but that's where that 25% of the allocations being based on the biomass distribution comes into play, where there's a southern region and a northern re region in the assessment. And, you know, it showed that the while the southern region's biomass has not declined, the increase um, that we see in the stock is very um, visible in, in the northern area. And so our allocation um, currently is 13% and is probably going to, based on the current biomass distribution, will go up to around 15%. Okay, thank you. If, if this is going anywhere, we just may need some public outreach to, to the masses to, to clarify, um, but we'll cross that bridge if, if it occurs. Uh, last thing with, with the bluefish, um, with that measure, uh, there was some status quo proposals, if I recall properly, because there was uh, those who were attacking the MRIP numbers, and as much as that's attacked, that's the best available science, uh, so I have to assume we have to go by those numbers. Uh, is there, with, with what's on the, the table and where that may go, uh, I would uh, I just like to for you to indicate are, are they at the point of status quo or moving on to something different with the other options that were proposed? Um, well, there there are status quo options in terms of the the commercial recreational allocation. There, the status quo option is there, um, which is the 1980s landings using the pre-calibrated MRIP data, um, and I think. I, I find it, it's very unlikely that um, there won't be an update to the commercial recreational allocation, you know, recognizing that those data from the 1980s have been, you know, corrected through the rec recalibration. Um, so I wouldn't expect status quo on that, on that issue. Right, thank you, Nicola, well done by you and DMF, appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Michael. Any other questions for Nicola before I go back to the director? Khalil? Khalil, thank, you're right. You're right. Thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Nicola, could, could you go back to the striped bass um, slide? Um, are you, maybe, and maybe, maybe um, uh, Michael uh, Armstrong can help out with this. Are there any red flags that are coming up right now that to um, to say that ASMFC is seeing that there may be some major issues coming up with the striped bass? I, th I think the, you know, the board is at this point and it's, it's said kind of in the meeting summary from last, from, from the meeting that the, you know, the board is at the point, you know, that recognize that the, this isn't a situation where we can just keep on going along as we have been with striped bass and that, you know, measures, something needs to be done to, um, you know, stop the decline. Uh, okay. Um, and, and that's uh, the, and that's the goal of amendment seven, you know. Yeah, a lot, a lot can happen in two years. And uh, we're talking about an approved draft amendment in 2023. Um, if, if in fact, if in fact, there is 
there, there is concern for what's going on. Uh, is, is there no way to speed up the process to, to get a draft amendment sooner than October of 2023? Uh, so 2023 would be the implementation date. Um, the draft amendment has to be developed and approved for public comment this October. Um, and then there would be a round of public comment. So then by the time any issues were adopted, it would be likely too late for 2022. Um, I think it will be interesting to um, when we further develop the issues about how to protect the 2015 year class, we're going to see, you know, that it's already entering the fishery in, in 2022. And, uh, you know, maybe if when the board sees that there, you know, there could be um, potentially some interest to to move that item up. Um, but but we'll, we'll see once we get those anal analyses from the technical committee. Okay, yeah, because I, I understand that. And because it is it, I, I even though I, I um, voted to increase the, uh, the commercial fishing days, uh, which I received some heat, heat upon, but I thought they, I thought, you know, we had come to a nice compromise and uh, there is some, you know, we're trying to represent the recreational and the commercial uh, components. Um, if in fact, if in fact the scientists and folks really feel that there is an issue with the striped bass, I really, and I'm just, I'm just giving my little editorial. I really feel we need to move as quickly as possible to come up with measures to protect uh, the spawning, uh, you know, the uh, spawning fish as, as best as possible. And I just hope that things would move quickly and efficiently, and that we wouldn't have certain states trying to to roadblock this. Uh, so, but in any case, thanks, Nicole. Nicole, I really appreciate your information. You're welcome. Any other questions for Nicola? Not seeing any, Jared. Not seeing any. If we want to move to Dan's comments on the Lobster Management Board. Director McKeon. Yeah, thanks, Ray. So um, what's we're being worked on behind the scenes is this draft um, addendum 27, um, which talks about the resiliency of the stock. And I, I think this comes out of a, a real a concern in Maine because the fishery uh, peaked a couple of years ago at all time highs. And this has been well documented by the technical committee that independent of, of management, there, there has been this these three stanzas more or less in the last three decades uh, where, um, you know, the, the earlier stanza were relatively, you know, moderate productivity, something that I saw at the beginning of my career. And then the last two decades have been increasingly more abundant, and so now the stock is almost tw twice at 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 the level that it was, um, you know, 15 years ago. Um, but the fishery has has sort of grown up, and the and the market demands for lobsters are such that there's there's some who want to see if we can't maintain the the biomass at some high level, and. You know what's being debated uh, between the tech among the technical committee members, and then will be debated by the plan development team members, of which Bob Glenn is a member of the PDT, and of course Tracy Pugh is on the technical committee. Is is the question of, um, of of is it logical to try to maintain the stock at this at at such a high level? Is it even possible? And and. I guess one of the themes of this is the Southern New England stock, uh, by comparison, when it went into decline, the, the managers fiddled and diddled and, and we didn't really come up with much that was going to arrest that decline. It took many years. I think what's being uh, uh, attempted here is to come up with some management uh, strategies that could be triggered when certain uh, uh, thresholds are met. And what are those thresholds? fishery independent surveys like the trawl survey or the ventless trap survey or a stock assessment that shows that the stock has declined. Once you go beyond, below some, some trigger, mech, uh, trigger level, then something should happen. And so the, some of the things we're talking about is like raising the gauge, um, you know, uh, to, to something to protect more, more spawning females, things like that. But this is very much uh, a work in progress the, the TC has yet to come to closure on that, and then the PDT is going to be um, uh, wrestling with it as well. You know, at the end of the day, as they say, um, 
it's going to be important that if there is such a a an addendum that's created with a with a triggered mechanism in my personal view i don't think we can have conservation equivalencies because those usually just weaken the the management uh, rigor or the, or the conservation rigor of the plan and ultimately the state that lands 90 percent of the u.s lobsters uh, maine uh, has to ac accept this because um, if not, then then it, uh, it 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 just won't work. So um, that's I want to uh, that's all I want to talk about there. As far as this electronic vessel tracking, uh, this is consistent with sort of my opening comments that people are really starting to wake up to the fact that uh, we really need um, better uh, delineation of the footprint of the lobster fishery and. Story Reed and Anna and others of DMF have been working with their colleagues in Maine and Rhode Island to, to uh, test some of these low cost uh, devices that, that might uh, allow us to see the, 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 uh, the activities of, of a lobster trip um, to pinpoint the locations of where the gear is being fished, et cetera. And that would be so beneficial, uh, not only for, for fisheries management purposes, but and the modeling of the of the whale risk relative to entanglements, uh, but also and and the issues I talked about earlier, you know, as as the lobster fishery confronts the the threats of offshore development of aquaculture and and wind, it's so important to to be able to look at the footprint of the lobster fishery. I would like to mention, and and we didn't talk about this much in the earlier wind discussion, but should wind come to the Gulf of Maine and it's expected to in the next decade, uh, it's going to be different than the Southern New England um, uh, technology. In Southern New England, the water is fairly shoal, uh, shallow enough so that you can embed uh, these devices, you know, into the, into the sediment uh, and with the pole, with the, the turbine sitting on top of a pole. But in the Gulf of Maine where it's much deeper, those are going to be uh, floating platforms. And they're all going to be, um, you know, cabled, uh, you know, to this to the ocean floor, which means it's probably going to be even more likely that fishing is going to be excluded um, from those locations. And um, and so it's so important that the we figure out like where the lobster fishing is going if if the lobster fishery wants to sort of preserve its its uh, its opportunities to fish. So. Um, Anyway, so that's what's motivating the electronic vessel tracking. And uh, I'll just take any questions. Questions for the director. Mike Fairnock. Michael, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to note that those proposed wind turbines uh, that are floating wind turbines with floating lines that are in the area of Platts Bank. I just shot you guys a photograph of it. I don't know whether that can be put on there, but I, you know, on the screen, but uh, I just want to make sure all are aware of the fact that, that that's where it's proposed and the chart I forwarded you outlined the approximate area. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, if I just could comment, uh, that particular project is a, a state of Maine initiative and uh, one of the features of that is it's a fairly small uh, scale project. I think it's only 12 um, turbines and they want to uh, kind of test drive this technology and get out ahead of this. Um, one of the challenges of course is because it's only 12 turbines, they, uh, it, it needed to be um, closer to shore. So it's possible in the future that, that the, the, um, that these, wind arrays could be much further from shore and still profitably run a cable from offshore to inshore. This is kind of a strange project in that uh, it doesn't necessarily portend that, that every other project is gonna have to be this close to shore. This one does because of its scale, but future projects could be even further offshore. So that's the tricky part. Yeah, thank you, because that, that would be in federal waters. Thank Yeah, thank you for Yeah, that. yeah, even this is this project is in federal waters. It's almost all going to be in federal waters, but um, but depending on the scale, if it's a big project, it could be really far offshore. Where, where there has been outreach to identify recreational for hire and commercial use of the federal waters off of Massachusetts and Maine and New Hampshire, and as you indicated earlier, we discussed how that's complicating things that 
to identify where those areas are, we have the same problem there as well as everywhere else up and down the coast. Bill Amaro. Bill, you're recognized. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dan, I'm trying to discern the nuance in your, your description of uh, vessel monitoring for lobster vessels in our, in our fishery. Can you state whether or not uh, the fleet should become aware of the fact that they are going to be required to have vessel monitoring in the near future or not? Yeah, Bill, I can't predict that, um, but I would campaign for that. I, I think that it's, it's um, I mean, I would tell any, any lobsterman individually or any group of lobstermen that they're being left in the dust by the, the more industrial uh, fleets that all have VMS when it comes to negotiating like where offshore projects go because their footprint isn't covered. Um, so that's a really good question. I mean, that, what's come up at the ASMFC is, is a, a sticky question of whether or not um, trackers should be required in the lobster fleet and under whose authority, the ASMFC or the uh, NIMS authority. And NIMS has responded to the Atlantic States saying uh, they would like to see the ASMFC, uh, if it's gonna go forward to create an addendum to the lobster management plan where this could be um, kind of codified. And I think a lot of the states are, are, are not so um, uh, patient because, you know, they think that's just going to delay um, the implementation of this. But um, I, that's that's being discussed about whose jurisdiction should it be under. So, um, so yeah, so should, I mean, again, this is very much a work in progress, Bill, but my, my conclusions made over the last few months is that I would love to to get this message to every lobsterman of why this really um, is is in their best interest, and you know make sure it's kept confidential. But my goodness, the uh, it's really important. Okay, well I I'm going to say this that I operated um, since the beginning of VMS uh, requirements under ground fish management, and uh, suffered through some of the learning difficulties at the beginning and some of them some of the difficulties that exist to this day and one of the requirements are that if the vms isn't working properly the vessel has to return to shore it'll receive an email requiring it under no uncertain terms to to return to port and i i knowing the way the lobster fishery operates where they're at sea so often and on so many different trips in relatively short period of time I just hope that there can be a, a, a way of implementing a VMS program that works uh, for the benefit of the fishing industry, as well as for the benefit of collecting the data that's important. And there's certainly no denying the fact that that data is important. You pointed it out several times. Um, I, although I, I hope that with all the reporting we've had to do about our locations uh, by paper, that there'd be a fairly good trail to determine where activity is taking place. Of course, nothing is going to equal the uh, on, uh, on water reporting it as it's taking place. That would be much better. But um, I, I remain a little skeptical uh, of the overall process of tracking an individual's actions at sea uh, to the degree that BMS does do. And, and not always does it provide just what it's intended to provide if you catch my drift. <laughs> I wonder if Story Reed um, could speak to the, the what he's learning through his pilot program. Sure. Can you hear me? Yep. So yeah, there's there's several different um, iterations of these pilot programs going on. Um, Anna's got one going with Rhode Island that's integrating the tracking data with uh, the electronic trip reports, um, and then what we've done with Maine is just using these uh, lower cost, higher ping rate tracking systems on lobster boats. Uh, and Maine's done some work, their GIS analyst has done some work with just that data alone. Um, can you identify where the efforts are taking place? And they've had some um, pretty interesting results on that that we could share at another meeting. Um, and the other thing I'll say about this technology is it's, it's just so rapidly evolving in terms of capabilities 
and actually reduction in costs. So that's a pretty interesting uh, development that just continues. You know, the longer this discussion goes on, the more options there are and different different ways to do this. Well, that, that's good to hear. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think we've made a lot of progress. I know we have, but uh, okay. So I made my points and you clarified additional ones. And I appreciate all that. And we'll see how we, how we move forward. I, I think at this point, the fleet is aware of the fact though that VMS is uh, monitoring of some type is nearly a fait accompli and they, they expect it. Let's just hope that it happens in a way that's economical and doesn't burden them any further because burdens have been coming a plenty as we know. Thank you. Thank you, William. Any other questions for the director? Mike Pernock. Michael, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I would just like to note uh, going through this process for the four hire fleet uh, with what Bill just mentioned, uh, we're, we're concerned of the cost and need if we were required to have vessel monitoring systems. And it's my understanding that with the EVTRs, and I think Story just noted that, that uh, we can turn, a, turn it on and our transiting details will be on the EVTRs and it will remain confidential. So that's a much more cost-effective approach that could be taken uh, rather than VNMS. Uh, I just throw that out there. I agree there's, uh, there's some other ways to do this and with technology today, VMS may not necessarily be necessary. Um, but the key with what all are continue to state, this, this needs to remain confidential. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other questions for the director? Not seeing any further questions, we'll move on to council update. Yes, please, Melanie Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll try to be as brief as possible in providing an update on the New England Council activities from the April meeting and give you a heads up on what to expect from the June meeting. So back in April, there were no final actions scheduled. The council time was pretty much given over to you know, various action item updates uh, and continuing development on those. But um, Logistically, there was some executive guidance that's been developed on use of remote technology for meetings. Uh, this will be added to the operations handbook, but for now we're kind of allowing a little time for experience and modification. The guidance though is that council meetings are going to be reverting as soon as possible to in-person. June is still going to be remote. Uh, remote for the council meetings really would be for a listen only option, and it might be considered for general public comments. The committees and APs could consider remote for shorter meetings and less controversial issues. Hybrid really would be extreme circumstances, but better to go fully remote, like if there was a, a snowstorm or something that impeded travel. Uh, a mixed approach of both remote and in-person will be used for public hearings and continue to be used for PDTs. So other than that, in April, there was a lot of focus on climate change discussions. and. I'm going to highlight some of those presentations. It was the first time that I'm aware of that we got a better glimpse at how NIMS is really looking to create that, that mechanistic link between climate research and fisheries management. Um, Dr. Vincent Saba of the Science Center, uh, he's, he's at the Fluid Dynamics Lab in Princeton, provided an overview, not only of the observed change on the shelf, but also this national climate science strategy and the Northeast Regional Action Plan, along with some of the accomplishments of that plan over the last five years. So next slide. So some key takeaways about the state of the ecosystem, seasonal um, sea surface temperature on Georgia's bank and in Gulf of Maine has been increasing between about 0.2 and 0.5 degrees Celsius in the past decade. This is particularly during summer and fall. It's been more stable in the winter. Marine heat waves are intensifying. That's both in terms of max temperature and duration, and this is particularly in the Gulf of Maine. The Gulf Stream is shifting northward, and there was a, in 2019, it was the farthest north on record. There's greater contribution of warmer slope water than cooler Labrador slope water since about 2010. Surface pH is declining. Um, there's some work with gliders that's just starting to investigate this at depth. And as we all know, you know, fish are on the move. In the mid, this has been observed as 
centers of biomass occurring at more northerly latitudes, while uh, up here in New England on Georgia's Bank and in the Gulf of Maine, it's more about shifting into deeper waters. Next slide, Jared. So the National Climate Science Strategy and its associated action plan, this is the Fed's approach to increasing the production, delivery, and use of climate-related information with respect to fisheries management. It's being operationalized through these action plans that seek to build regional capacity, these so-called communities of practice. Um, the New England action plan, uh, the initial one was adopted back in 2016 and it's good through 2021. There's already a 2.0 action plan that's in the works. And a lot of it focuses on uh, climate vulnerability assessments, uh, scenario planning, lab studies, uh, projections of species distributions and things like that. The big goal though is really to further develop and apply ocean models that are capable of high resolution hindcasting, forecasting and of producing projections. So the council's discussion in April really focused on what I what I mentioned earlier that missing link between climate science and fisheries management. So, you know, how stock assessments and variables like recruitment, growth and mortality are affected by climate change vari variables such as uh, temperature and circulation pH. Uh, the council also briefly touched on the seeming inflexibility of the legal framework of MSA when it comes to being adaptive to, to climate science. So this is going to be a real ongoing discussion. One of the uh, tools that's being used right now in the region to, to continue that discussion and really provide for adaptive management is scenario planning. Uh, it's not meant to be a predictive exercise for individual fishery management plans, but it's more a a general look at, at how governance can be improved uh, for things like joint management, uh, establishing more management priorities that are robust to future conditions and avoiding uh, reduced flexibility to adapt. So this is being conducted by the Northeast Region Coordinating Council. They just met and reviewed their technical team's draft straw man. They should be holding workshops this fall. So um, stay tuned for that. And I'll have some more information for you after the June council meeting, because we'll be receiving an update on that. Um, I do just briefly want to mention, sorry, Jared, just one second back, uh, the One NOAA seminar series. They, they, this is um, kind of a consolidation of various webinars and presentations, but they generally have uh, several climate related topics every month. And coming up on June 24th is a Science Center webinar that will be given on temperature linked assessments for winter flounder and Gulf of Maine cod. So that might be interesting to some. And the last climate related topic that I do wanna to touch on is the America Be the Beautiful Report, which will be a discussion item at the June council meeting. This is the federal administration's written, initial written response. Uh, and to quote them for a 10 year locally led and voluntary nationwide effort to restore and conserve US lands, waters, and wildlife. So this is really the, um, res the initial response uh, to that executive order um, it, that they gathered initial input that included the 30 by 30 um, initiative and uh, a request on how to make climate, uh, or excuse me, climate resilient fisheries. So, since that report came out earlier in May, I think the initial reception has been positive across a lot of interest groups. Um, I think mainly because it's it's focused on locally derived efforts and it does recognize private property rights. So there's still a lot to be determined about how uh, the administration is best going to achieve that 30% goal. So again, stay tuned there. Uh, next slide, Jared. So finally, looking forward to the June council meeting at the end of this month, other than kind of the usual development of annual specifications, I'll just highlight a few unique priorities that will be on the agenda. For groundfish, there's, we're gonna get some updates on the cod stock structure revision efforts. There are two parallel tracks right now. Science is going on now and management will be starting shortly. And these are working towards informing and responding to respectively the, the upcoming research track in 2023. But the council will also be considering any management measures it could adopt regardless of, of the assessment outcomes. That, that would be a, a final council decision in September. So we'll see how that develops. Um, 
Regarding groundfish, there will also be discussions on ABC control rule revisions. The SSC meets next week to discuss this GMRI-led work. Uh, scallops, we have a limited access leasing petition for secretarial action. The council is scheduled to provide feedback to GARFRO on this. Uh, we'll also be receiving updates on the plan development team's suggested approach to a rotational management review. Uh, that work's gonna be ongoing through the fall. And we'll also get ep updates on the efforts of the scallop survey working group. Uh, herring, we'll just be getting updates. There are no actions for the council in June, so I'll try to be brief, but the primary focus right now is on framework nine, which is the vehicle for adopting a rebuilding plan and potentially revising accountability measures. Um, to date, the work on rebuilding alternatives uh, has, has been based on Amendment 8's harvest control rule and a seven-year fixed uh, fishing mortality approach. The big issue has been how to treat recruitment, and I don't want to get into the weeds here, but the, the council likely is going to be looking at some recruitment sensitivities that it can have in its pocket when it's making final decisions. I'll just note that um, White Hake just adopted a rebuilding plan in Framework 61, and they, the, the plan actually adopted a 10-year rebuilding plan in lieu of a shorter one, recognizing some similar issues with recent poor recruitment. Um, the, also with Herring, we'll also be updated on Framework 7, which is uh, the Georgia's Bank Spawning Protection Measures vehicle. Work uh, basically is ongoing and potential final action is not slated until December, so we still have some time with that one. Uh, just to round it out, the last couple of topics for the June meeting include ecosystem-based fishery management, skates, uh, finalizing some updated research priorities through 2025, and Mike, you might be interested in this one, uh, a potential comment letter on the Southeast region's EVTR requirements. So I apologize if that was too much time, but hopefully that was informative. And as always, if you have any questions on this, you can reach out to me directly for further, further detail. Thanks. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, will you mind taking questions now if somebody? A absolutely. Thank you. Questions for Melanie on her presentation. Mike Beardock. Michael, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Melanie. If, if you could forward me the details to comment on the VTRs for the Southeast, that would be great. I will. I don't have anything yet, but as soon as I get them, I will forward them to you. And also, if we could be forwarded the webinar you mentioned towards the end of the month. Will do. And uh, I failed to, to note that with uh, Nicola um, noted the MRIP meeting next week, if, if that could also be forwarded to us so we can try to listen in. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other questions for Melanie on her presentation? I'm not seeing any further questions if we want to move back to the agenda. Yes, we will do that. Uh, allowing Menhaden Saining on Fridays in Boston Harbor. Yep, thank you, Ray, I'll take that. Um, Jared, if you could throw up that map that Khalil had asked us before the meeting to have on display. Um, so commission members, this, uh, this requires a little bit of history, but um, the memo that we sent to you as part of the, the meeting uh, materials, I, I think covers most of what I wanna talk about. The, um, Menhaden Saining in, in inside the harbors and estuaries has always been one of the, one of our major challenges, and I have to admit it's been pretty quiet over the past handful of years. Uh, I think we've done a really good job of um, keeping the peace and and managing it in such a way that everybody's getting kind of what they need out of the system. Um, there was an incident about a decade ago uh, in Boston Harbor where. Um, well, let me back up. There's about four or five active boats that actually uh, use these inshore net permits. These are the grandfathered boats that, um, that fish inside of our, our, um, our estuaries. And if you don't have the inshore net permit that's been limited entry forever, you can't get one. And, you, and so, uh, you know, as a result, we've got four or five, uh, you know, guys who are really experienced, have been doing it for a long time, and they're pretty good at, at, not, um, at, at not causing a lot of conflict in, inside these, 
these crowded areas. Um, the other upside, of course, to, to Menhaden harvest uh, up inside of the, the harbors is that when there's a fish kill, it's a big problem. And, and so there is, there is benefit to extracting Menhaden from the really shallow, uh, con, you know, constricted waters um, that, that we, we believe. There's also a limited entry and there's also an overall quota. And so when, um, when about 10 years ago, there was a, one of the saners uh, was, was not fishing legally on many different levels and also was, um, was becoming the, the bane of, of many recreational uh, fishermen's existence. They came to Director Diodati and they asked for um, action to be taken against this individual and also against, uh, and, and they, they campaigned to eliminate Fridays in Boston Harbor. And I was uh, involved with it back then. And as I recall, this particular um, decision that Paul made where he, uh, he prohibited uh, Friday fishing as a permit condition, it's not part of the code of Massachusetts regulations. It wasn't, didn't go to the Marine Fishers Advisory Commission for, for, for blessing. And that's sort of the nature of how we manage the, the Menhaden fishery, um, if, you can, if you have access to your, to your memo, um, there's the May 24th, 2021 statement of permit conditions. And you can see that some of these are pretty, pretty area specific and that's been the nature of, of how this fishery has been managed and the previous commissions have been comfortable. Uh, I, would, I would go on, at least I, I believe they were comfortable, you know, giving, the the, uh, the the DMF director, you know, authority to kind of manage this in, in near real time, like on on the fly, such as, you know, the size of the purse saints and the well, here's one that says, you know, you, you can't use spotter planes, um, you know, before 8 a.m. You got to stay away from residential areas. So there's a whole bunch of rules in here that that are are were written as, as, to respond to conflict. So um, if you recall in the April um, minutes under other business, I mentioned that we'd received a request from the Hull purse Um Like I said, there's about four of them who fish and this one saner who fishes out of Hull came to us and said, well, with this, with this Friday closure, the, the guys who fish in other parts, you know, who, are, who originate from the other ports, they can go fish locally on Fridays, but I'm kind of, I'm tied up, you know what I mean? So, so he was wondering if that could be lifted, uh, especially as is mentioned in the mass bass letter that this particular individual has, has worked um, or made a special effort to, um, to get along uh, on the water and, and with some of the other users. And so um, I, I considered that, I sort of forecasted this in the minutes where it says, uh, Dan and staff were preparing a memorandum to the commission that explains this request and Dan's likely decision to allow it for 2021. So I guess my point is that, um, that the commission members have not been um, always consulted on this, this, this real time on the fly kind of management. Maybe that wasn't my, you know, uh, it, maybe I should have been more, um, you know, forthcoming and, and brought you into the conversation, um, and I, I will in the future. In, in this particular case, because I do value, I mean, you guys are here for, for this purpose, right? You're here to talk about the places, the times, and the manners of fishing, and, and I think this is worthy of, of commission discussion. But having said that, we did send out a letter of all the permit conditions, lifting the Friday closure. Uh, in my view, uh, the, the, the people who are fishing in the Boston Harbor area are doing a, a, a good job at, at keeping the peace. Um, the fact that there's an organization that came out you know, in favor of this one individual's access on Fridays. Um, I didn't see it as a problem uh, you know, to, to allow this because it is quota managed and, um, and the, the, the individual has done a, a really good job at, um, at, at trying to get along with the other users. So this decision was made. So, to, so the agenda goes out and it talks about a discussion item of allowing Boston Harbor fishing on Fridays. Um, so I've, I've already sent the permit conditions out under the, the authority of the director, but somebody got a hold of this agenda and thought that this was a decision to be made at this meeting. 
And boy, I've got a lot of hate mail um, from, from individuals who, who aren't in favor of, of, of Menhaden extraction, who aren't in favor of commercial uh, bass fishing, who, aren't, who, who want all kinds of things, including they want me to resign. So anyway, it is what it is. This is, this is you know, if it wasn't hard, they wouldn't call it work. So I just want to answer any questions of the, the, the commission may have about either process and about going forward. If this causes a lot of conflict, we can certainly rescind this. We can rescind it to as easily as we re, as it reinstated it. And I'm willing to do that if, if this is causing a lot of problems. I don't expect it will. This individual who fishes there is, uh, is, is very sensitive to the issues. It's true that some of the other members uh, of, of the intro net fleet could come down. I don't expect them to because the areas uh, up where they fish are open on Fridays. And on the screen, you can see the Menhaden per se restricted areas and the white purple areas are the areas where the special rules apply such as you know net sizes, et cetera. The red areas are the closures, and those have evolved over time over the last 40 years to placate uh, like local harbor masters and environmental police and others to keep them out of problematic areas. So I'm happy to talk about this. Uh, I, I regret and maybe I apologize for maybe um, not coming uh, forward, allowing you folks to weigh in. Um, but this is how it's been done historically, but I'm willing to listen to any concerns that you have at this time. Okay, Dan, I'll open this up to discussion. Please raise your hand. Khalil? Khalil, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, another complicated issue. Uh, I, I feel that uh, there's a lot of optics involved with this and, and there are always two sides to the story. Uh, the fact of the matter is we are allowing the per to take place uh, Monday through Thursday. And, and, and that, didn't, that has not seemed to be an issue with uh, the recreational uh, component, uh, the people who are reaching out and the, and the letters which we've all been getting. Um, and it, it just it, it kind of concerns me a little bit that it just takes one person uh, who is using this, these waters, I guess, Monday through Thursday, that all of a sudden this one person says he'd like to petition and open it up for Fridays, that that we um, all of a sudden say, okay, let's do it. But things seem to be working well at this point, Monday through Thursday. And um, I, I understand that, that the, the director has the discretion to be able to uh, open this up on Friday. And, uh, and, and this is I knew we were. We knew this was coming up, but I, I, I personally am against it. Um, from the fact that things have worked well Monday through Thursday, why why open it up on Friday if, if the person needs to uh, the person needs to go out and get more fish? I understand there's a steaming issue, steaming here and steaming there, and it's not quite as uh, economically uh, efficient to do that. Um, it's not like we're shutting them off from Monday through Thursday. And uh, I, I just, I, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable personally, and it's, and it's an opinion, uh, opening it up on, on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Bill Doyle. Bill, you're recognized. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, not specifically to the Manhattan, but to a, a, a broader housekeeping issue that's been raised to me in, in the last month. But I think we need to seek some guidance on what goes before the commission and what doesn't from legal. Uh, and I would just uh, suggest that we look into that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And Sharon? Mike Pernock. Michael, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a few questions and then uh, I'll, I'll summarize comments. Um, what is the daily limit for this vessel? Is it 6,000 pounds per trip or 6,000 pounds per day? Is that a trip limit or a daily limit? And that's number one. And number two, um, does this fishery fill its quota? Has it been able to fill its quota? 
Uh, where does that stand as of now? And filling the quota for this year and last year, were they able to do such? And Nicola had noted earlier that there's a, there's a line item, there's supposed to be a discussion of Menhaden, commercial Menhaden at the upcoming Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission meeting. And I, I was curious, is that to reduce the quota, increase the quota, or what's that all about? So there's a few things there. And then after that, I, I have some comments. Thank you. Dan, I can speak to the regulatory component if you want. Yeah, go ahead, Jared. Thanks. Sure. So the the folks operating under the inshore net permit, they operate in the limited entry fishery. The limited entry fishery begins at 125,000 pound trip limit. And once 85% of that quota is taken, that trip limit is reduced to 25,000 pounds. The vessel fishing in the Boston Harbor area is not one of the larger capacity vessels in the fleet. So even when the trip limit is 125,000 pounds, they're not operating at that vessel. It's a lobster boat that doesn't work with the carrier. So they typically would fish at the 25,000 pound level. Um, and then once the quota is taken, they could opt in, if we opt into the episodic event set aside, or we continue to run the, um, the uh, incidental catch limit, where, which would be the 6,000 pound limit. So, so therefore they could land 25,000 per day or per trip and then it could default to 6,000. It's a calendar day trip limit. Um, so these vessels are operating, you know, one trip, one day. Okay. Thank you. And the, the ASMC action or potential action is looking more at the state by state commercial allocations. Um, you know, right now we have a little bit over 1% of the coastwide quota. Um, and, uh, you know, states like ourselves and Maine are, are interested in uh, higher allocations that reflect the increased abundance in the, in the Northeast in, in recent years, given that those allocations were based only on landings from 2009 to 2011, so a pretty limited time series. Um, and then also looking at things like what gears are um, eligible to participate in the fishery after the state's quota has been taken. So it's separate from the annual specification of the total coastwide quota. Last year, they utilized their quota. Did they utilize their quota? And by when? And where do we stand this year with the quota status? Last. Sure, I take that. Yep. He's got some fresh numbers. Sure. So. In terms of this year's quota, we're at about 50% utilization through yesterday. And so then at, at the 85% utilization threshold, we drop down to that 25,000 pound per day uh, trip limit for those in the limited entry fishery. Last year, I don't have it right in front of me, but I believe we hit our quota um, around the third week of July-ish. And we did uh, obtained some additional quota from other states, and we also opted into the episodic event set aside um, for a week and a half or so. Right, Nicola? Correct. And, and so because of those two things, opting into the episodic set aside and um, obtaining some additional quota from other states, we were able to keep the fleet, the limited entry fleet um, going at that 25,000 pound per day trip limit. Um, basically through the, the season. Does that cover you, Mike Pierdnock? Yeah, thank you. And now I just have a, a few comments. I mean, you, you see the response by uh, the community or the masses with the emails. I, I was also the recipient of that text messages and phone calls the past few days. Um, a, a few things. I, I mean, I spoke to Mass Stripe Bass Association. I spoke to uh, uh, others, uh, fishermen. I, I, I do what I always do when it comes to the Boston waterfront. I call, call Pete, Pete Santini. I call him the king of the Boston waterfront and spoke to him and uh, went from there and spoke to many others. Uh, they were all very surprised at this. They were all very disappointed at this to see that uh, this proposed measure would, would happen on, to open things up on Friday. 
um, you know, it's, it's no doubt that the, the, everyone's saying the same thing, that the purse saner that is uh, requesting this has been a good fella, has done well, and tries to avoid gear conflicts. Um, I, I guess uh, with, with the masses as well as myself, I, I'm just somewhat surprised because he's done such a good job to avoid that. And now he's going to put himself in a situation on Fridays where Friday, Saturday, and Sundays are your recreational for hire days of people taking off and we're going to work, uh, going fishing early or, or later in the day and, you know, uh, fishing during those times that he's going to increase the conflict. So I, I almost see whether the action within itself is, is going to cause problems and then all the goodwill that he's put together to get to the point he has today, whether it's really worthwhile trying to do this. You know, in addition, since it is Boston Harbor, you, uh, I believe you all get them. I get the calls too, and it, they're not fishermen calling and they're, they see it and don't understand the process and so on. So that potential's increased because it is Boston and, and there's greater visibility. And, and the fact that there's been such a great uh, striped bass fishery last year and because various reasons and so on with temperature and no lack of uh, uh, bait fish that uh, there's a tremendous amount of stripers there and there's a tremendous amount of people fishing there so look this uh, as this is an issue that's just going to lead to conflict um said they don't want it open i don't know whether plan b is you allow such through through a so-called pilot for this year and the minute you get the complaints you, I believe you have the ability to shut it down, uh, but I, I, I'll just need some clarification with that. And, and lastly, the fact that there doesn't seem to be an issue with filling the quota, why would you wanna go in there and once again, impact the goodwill that you created that could ultimately hurt you when you don't really need to go in there to fill the quota? So, um, you know, there you go. That's that's my thoughts, the thoughts of others. Um, I, I would add to it that, uh, you know, uh, communicating with organizations or so on during these times of COVID, COVID can be difficult. And, uh, you know, maybe that's what happened with Mass Straight Bass, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I did speak to them. They provided me the, the basis behind this, which, which he was a good player. He's done well, and this was uh, an olive branch to uh, reach out to uh, allow him in there. So uh, that's it. That's my thoughts. I'd be able to add or answer any more questions uh, if need be. Thank you. Yeah, Dan, is, uh, have you got more hands up, Jared? No. Yeah, Dan, this is Ray Kane speaking. I. Uh, I read the recommendation from the Mass Strike Bass Association, and it's so stated in their letter to you that they would like to see this run under a pilot program this year and see the outcome of it. So I think it was disingenuous to say that you've got the Mass Strike Bass Association supporting you. They are, but they also ask that it be run as a pilot program. So is there any way you could run it as a pilot program this year for the satisfaction? Yeah, I mean, Ray, we issue permit conditions every year and, and over the winter we decide which ones we want to tweak. So certainly uh, if the commission wants to put this on the agenda for a winter meeting and talk about it, I'd be certainly willing to do that or sooner if, if something blows up. Um, extracting schools of Menhaden from uh, up, way up inside of these rivers is a really good idea, uh, in my view. The fish kill that we had over um, near what is now the new casino was horrific a few years ago. I mean, it was it was so bad that we were they were look, um, some people in state government were looking at a six figure bill to pay clean harbors to come get all the dead fish off the shoreline. So um, you know this is. This is a delicate balance of not wanting to have, um, you know, to, to want forage, to have recreational fishing, 
but but having these skilled, experienced individuals to be able to get up inside and and extract these schools when they are in in, in vulnerable places where they can create fish kills by using up the oxygen um, has benefits. And a lot of people who don't want to see um, the extraction of Menhaden uh, seven days a week, never mind four or five. And so I'm certainly open-minded. I want to keep the peace. So I say, let's let this run over the summer, see what happens. And, and if, uh, if things go crazy, then, uh, you know, next year we'll go to four days a week uh, if, if that's the right thing to do. But um, anyway, it's, it's, this is, this is what it is. There are some, you know, hot button controversial issues that the DMF deals with. This is one of them. Uh, and like I said, it's been fairly quiet uh, for a while. Um, Story, Nicola, Jared, um, we all work on this kind of behind the scenes. Uh, we take a lot of calls from a lot of people. And, and um, you know, when uh, at the end of the day, we've got bait extracted, we've got good forage, we've got fish taken out and not, and not going belly up because they use up all the oxygen. But this is a balance. And so um, let's see how this works out um, this year and, and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Dan on this subject matter? Mike Pernod. Michael, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dan. Um, but just so I understand, or we understand, you have the ability to close it down within 24 hours or on notice. Yes. yes. Okay. So if, if there was severe conflict, the outcry was such, then, then you would be able to do that. Uh, just yeah, I mean, but Mike, I don't want to invite, you know, someone to just create a petition with, you know, a thousand signatures and say, now you need to close the area. I mean, I think we need to be responsible fishery managers and, and figure out what the goals are. But I'm willing to, to keep an open mind about this and uh, let's see how it plays out. Uh, certainly, I, I, I agree with you there. Um, with the target, uh, with the red, I'm, I have all these numbers written down here. Uh, are, are we at we're at fifty percent? I believe usage of the quota. Therefore, when do you suspect it will be used up? And yeah, uh, story well, story July, should weigh in here. July or no story oh. should weigh in. So what I think is going to happen is probably by the third week of June, we're probably going to be at uh, you know in excess of the eighty five percent, and then. If, if we get extra fish, we're probably going to operate the fishery at the 25,000 pound level. Um, and so that will continue until we use up whatever quota we have or whatever quota we can get from the episodic set aside that, that the ASMFC operates and whatever quota another state might give us. And so um, last year, I think we landed, what was it, Nickel, or about 8 million on a 6 million pound quota? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so so last year's quota, um, we, we we harvested another third by um, by you know Nicola making some phone calls and getting transfers from other states. I mean, this is this is not easy. There's 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 plenty of people on both sides of this. There's there's the bait needs of the lobster fishery and there's the bait needs of the of the tackle shops, and and then there's the forage needs. But at the same time, there's also horrific fish kills that happen up inside. We had one in Hingham Bay, I think about four years ago. And, um, you know, and it was blamed on a saner when in fact, nobody went in there. Um, it was, it was actually just low oxygen and it happened, I think in September later in the year. But, um, so yeah, we can, we can close this, uh, you know, overnight and, um, and we're going to, we'll keep you posted. You know, if you, if the commission wants, we can, have, um, have, you know, uh, Nicola, Jared and, and Story kind of keep everybody informed, you know, as we go with these, um, with these quota changes, as we get quota from other states. So you'll be made aware of it as we go. Thank you, Dan. And uh, I, I don't know if you have the ability to reach out to this per saner, but there are many more organizations, individuals, magazines and so on and mechanisms and ways and heat which that per center can communicate and and get input um, from others uh, in addition to mass striped bass association um I, I just sit here and 
I, I don't understand how that fishery works. That's not what I, I do. I, I don't know where you go. How I, I have some ideas of where you go, but I, I would hope that there's a decision that he makes when he goes out there on a Friday to try to avoid conflict. But I don't know, understand the way that works enough to be able to uh, sit here and be confident it's not going to lead to problems. Um, uh, lastly, what, what, when would this then go into effect? Um, it's, it's in effect now. So it is in effect now. Yeah. So with that, I have to assume he's been a good player, which he has been, and has stayed out of there. Or am I? I don't know. Or well, is he you're not allowed to fish in the intranet areas until June. Okay, there, that explains it. All yeah. right, very good. Tomorrow would be the first open day. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Khalil. Thank you, Jared. Um, I just I haven't heard I haven't heard from many other commission members. I don't know what their feelings are about this. Uh, I, I tell you what my feelings were, um, and I understand being on the commission now, the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission for five years. I've learned quickly learned that decisions aren't made easily, and uh, the directors probably weighed the pros and cons to, to his decision. And I can respect what he has to go through to do that. And I can understand his logic. Uh, for me, it's more of an optics. Uh, of things have been working fine for Monday through Thursday. There hasn't been many issues. There hasn't been any conflicts. I just hope this isn't going to manufacture artificial conflicts um, uh, from both sides. And, uh, so I, I've learned, and, and, and uh, Director, it's, uh, it's, it has nothing to do with uh, your decision. It's just my, my personal gut feeling. But uh, if it's going to be a, 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 a decision that can be reversed uh, if conflict does occur, I appreciate that, and I appreciate your efforts. And uh, I guess we'll just have to see how this plays out. Thank you. Bill Amaru. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Uh, I, I've listened to this discussion with open ears. I got to admit, when I finished reading the comments from the uh, public on this, I was rather sympathetic <clears throat> to the positions and the passion with which they wrote. Um, this is a tough one, and I have to congratulate Dan for, first of all, having the, having the stones for uh, standing up for what he believes is the right thing for the fishery, <coughs> or for the individuals involved, <clears throat> it appears that to me that there'll be far more people disadvantaged by this action than will be uh, advantaged by it. Um, that was my original gut sense. I, I tried to go in a direction that would benefit the most, the most individuals who will be working under a new set of rules, being that my history was in fishing was dominated by rules and regulations that I some I embraced and some I didn't. Uh, and this one, I, I cannot say I, I understand fully why we're doing it. Dan has, has given some very good reasons. Um, I guess not knowing more about the background of this fishery is a bit of a handicap. And I've learned a lot just from the discussion. Some very good arguments made on both sides. I'm, I'm simply going to say if Dan feels strongly about this and does have the ability to pull this ruling quickly if it becomes a, a conflict then if he feels it should be done then I'm going to support him on it uh, I didn't feel that way initially but his arguments uh, have proven fruitful in my decision making other commission members want to comment on this not seeing any other comments from the commission but Lieutenant Colonel Moran uh, would like to speak Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so Dan, this, this is not being run by a, an LOA. It's just open now on Fridays. Is that correct? No, Pat, every persainer is sent a list of permit conditions okay. for the season. And so it is a condition on their permit, but the, in this current list of conditions, 
the closure in Boston Harbor has been lifted, but the but the rest of the the like the purple areas remain. All the other restricted areas those those don't get lifted. Um, there was two uh, Friday closures, one in Beverly Harbor and one in Boston Harbor, and the Beverly Harbor one um, still exists. Okay, I, I guess because we know who the the complaints are going to come into. And that's more than likely going to be our dispatch center. So yeah. I just want to be able to um, deliver the right message or have our people deliver the right message um, when the complaints do come in. Because mm -hmm. we know they're going to come. Yeah. Mr. Okay. Chair, about seeing any other hands raised on this topic, would you like to move back to the agenda? I have them. Um... Oh, hi, Bill. Bill, did you have a comment? No, I'm sorry. I was just switching devices. Okay, then we can move along on the agenda. Uh, renewing the period two summer flounder pilot program. Dan, I can briefly run over this if you'd like. Yeah, let's do your best to try to stay on schedule. Yeah, so um, back two, two summers ago, uh, we were approached by a couple of draggers who were interested in adopting a pilot as the fl summer flounder had moved to the, to, to the, to the east of Nantucket Sound. Some of the inshore draggers approached us about allowing a uh, two-day limit where they could go out, take one limit one day, uh, either lay up at sea or come inside into Nantucket and, and lay up there rather than having to spend so much time steaming out uh, back and forth from the fishing grounds to Hyannis, Woods Hole, Valmouth, New Bedford, um, that allowing them to lay up and fish two consecutive days would help increase their efficiency. Um, we felt the program ran good in its first year, which was the very end of 2019. Uh, we renewed it last year and we're going to renew it again this year. This is an LOA fishery um, and we will, uh, we have renewed it and we will be getting out the LOAs and the tags to seal the containers um, next week. So this is just an update that that pilot program will be running again. I'll take any questions you have on it. Yeah, I have a question, Jared. So the harvesters have been responsible with this LOA and there haven't been infractions, uh, violations, and they're benefiting from this LOA. I have not been made aware of any violations of the conditions of this LOA or the tri trip limit rules. Um, so I'm working with the assumption that uh, there there is compliance with this and uh, in my informal discussions with members of the industry, um, it, it is a supported program because it does allow them to uh, to, to be a bit more efficient and lay up at sea um, uh, and avoid having large steaming times to and from port and deal with some of the, uh, the shoreside um, dockage issues that, that, that are coming up on the South Cape. Thank you. Any other questions for Jared? I'm not seeing any further questions, Mr. Chair. Okay, let's move along to the shellfish program updates. Jeff, do you have slides for this? I do. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and allow you to share. It's all yours. Thank you. All right, we uh, uh, recurring issues here. Uh, uh, three of them was the uh, certainly the wastewater treatment plant buffer zone and conditional area reclassification. Um, specifically, Plymouth, we uh, we reached our determination uh, last month, and we did a reanalysis of. Uh, the uh, dye study uh, uh, that was conducted by FDA back in June of 2018. 
we uh, have reclassified portions of uh, the three bay complex, uh, new areas uh, uh, in the middle in the uh, blue uh, uh, hatch are the conditionally approved areas. Uh, areas that are green are remain as straight approved. The uh, zooming in uh, a new area defined was CCB 45.7, the southern portion of uh, Duxbury Bay. Uh, CCB 41.2 is also a new uh, area that's part of this uh, conditionally approved classification. Uh, CCB 42.0 uh, was redefined as was uh, CCB 42.1, the closed prohibited area around the wastewater treatment plant that was expanded. And uh, CCB 43.1 and 43.3 are also part of the wastewater treatment plant impacted areas. So those are now conditioned based on the operation of the Plymouth wastewater treatment plant. And if there are upsets at the treatment plant, those areas will, uh, will, be, will be closed. Uh, for a period, we'll reassess based on the uh, flow rates at the wastewater treatment plant and discharge levels and determine the actual closure um, duration. So that's, uh, that's our reinterpretation, our, our analysis of the uh, dye study results. But it is, dye studies are, are, are very expensive and they uh, require a lot of uh, 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 manual labor, both conducting them as well as planning them. And they, they take a long time. So we're, we, we do need to, conduct uh, dilution analysis for wastewater treatment plants in up and down the coast. So we've, uh, we're hoping to use uh, modeling as our, our uh, uh, to replace dye studies in the future. So uh, we're trying to get a, uh, uh, an earmark from the legislature to fund uh, uh, modeling through UMass Dartmouth uh, SMAST uh, program. Uh, uh, Dr. Chen, has a, a nationally uh, recognized model. It's the standard uh, most hydrographers use. And uh, uh, on top of that, it, it's homegrown here in, uh, at SMAS. So we're hoping to uh, get a uh, funding through uh, the legislature to fund uh, uh, these studies at wastewater treatment plants up and down the coast using uh, uh, the, uh, it's called FVCOM. And uh, I don't know if you can see down the bottom in the small, uh, uh, description, FECOM is a prognostic unstructured grid, finite volume, free surface, 3D primitive equation. I, I'm not a modeler. I, I don't know how it works, but I'm told it's, uh, it's very good. And they, uh, they, they, they're right in the same building. So uh, this could be our uh, um, solution going forward. So we're, we're kind of uh, hoping this, uh, the funding comes through. Uh, the other uh, issue is uh, mooring areas. Uh, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're dealing with uh, having to uh, designate new mooring areas uh, in our areas and uh, issue uh, uh, either close during the boating season, a notice to close them, uh, or we could leave them open during the boating season, or uh, we can actually have uh, the area is uh, reclassified and closed year round. Um, so we'll uh, uh, this is uh, Duxbury. The uh, inner portion is, uh, is closed during the boating season. That's the deep water, has larger boats. Um, the uh, area that's uh, on the outside of that, surrounding that, is, uh, is a mooring area. It's designated as a mooring area and it's classified as conditionally approved, but it is open during the boating season. So there, there's a couple of treatments here we can, we can uh, apply our, our mooring area standards to. Um, here is up in Ipswich uh, with uh, the town had mooring areas already defined. So we've adopted those and we've uh, reclassified them as prohibited and they're closed year round. Uh, there are no shell, there is no shell fishing underneath these, uh, these boats and these mooring areas at any portion. So uh, reclassifying the area as prohibited uh, was a simple approach to, uh, to this issue. Uh, we've done dilution calculations for the number of boats in these areas and determined that uh, they do not impact the adjacent water. So flats uh, uh, 
uh, that are adjacent to these uh, uh, mooring areas are not impacted, even if there were a, uh, a discharge of one or two boats. And then uh, we have the, uh, the, uh, the strategic plan is complete. And uh, for MSI, uh, it, it was a, a long time in, in, in the works, but I think it's a great document. Uh, there's the uh, link to it if, uh, if you want to go uh, find it. It's massshellfishinitiative.org. Uh, uh, if nothing else, just read the executive summary, but it's a, it's a very good document and uh, it's really unprecedented. We've never taken this kind of uh, 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 holistic view of the shellfish industry. So uh, we're kind of proud of this. Uh, one uh, item that was brought to my attention yesterday that we didn't do a great job of covering, but it certainly is not a, uh, uh, as far as a five-year uh, crisis, is climate change. And that certainly is going to be uh, impacting the shellfish industry going forward. But we really did not address it very well in, in the plan. Uh, that said, we have addressed it in the uh, DMF shellfish uh, project uh, uh, strategic plan, but uh, we, I, think, uh, I think that's going to be a problem and, and not just for shellfish, but for, for all fisheries going forward. Uh, those are the updates for shellfish. Uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you for the presentation, Jeff. Questions for Jeff, please. Bill Amarim. William, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great report, Jeff. Uh, question on uh, a little bit of a different track. We're approaching what might be the record length of time for closure in the Nauset estuary for red tide. You must be looking at the, uh, the, the reports that are coming out fairly pretty much on a daily basis. What, what, what is your thinking on, on the this tremendous uh, cyst problem that we're having up there this year. Yeah, it's uh, we've seen uh, closures and toxicity in Nauset system. Uh, I think there's been two years we have not seen toxicity since 1972. Uh, this year was uh, particularly bad. Uh, uh, we had uh, counts in the salt pond over a thousand, which is very, very high. And uh, it's coming down slowly, uh, but uh, we've, we've seen uh, uh, <laughs> Newsflash here, we've, we've seen another bloom of, uh, of uh, 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 dinophysis, which is a DSP. So several years back, 2015, I believe, we had a closure for a DSP. And uh, we saw a, 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 a bloom of the dinophysis, which produces demoic acid. Uh, so that's a concern. Fortunately, uh, the area is, is now closed, but uh, it, it is a it's it's frustrating. It's it's vexing. Um, we can only imagine with the climate change and with these warming waters that we'll probably have more uh, uh, phytoplankton, harmful algal blooms uh, going forward. And it seems that Nauset is just this perfect uh, incubator for blooms. So yeah. I think uh, we're we're going to continue for uh, a closure at least for several more weeks. Yeah. All right. Um... Yeah, we, we, our population year round, of course, everybody knows about Barnstable County being one of the <clears throat> most uh, moved to counties in the country in the last 18 months. And it doesn't appear to be slowing down. We're um, working, as you probably know, on a, a strategic plan to develop our sewer system that will take hopefully a lot of this problem out of the water stream heading into the, the, the uh, bays and coves. But the short term solution doesn't seem to be very promising. Uh, I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, we're in the Shellfish and Waterways Committee. We're very frustrated. We have a lot of people who uh, have make their living this way, as well as a tremendous number of non commercial people who enjoy shell fishing. I, I, I wish there was something that the state, in this overall development of, of, of its initiative, could do to uh, recommend ways that communities can work towards improving our quality of our water flows and our and the quality of our estuary and uh, waters. Uh, I don't don't see anything in the MSI about it. Well, certainly, uh, yeah, it that's there, there were problems, there were uh, issues we could deal with in the MSI and issues we could not. And, uh, and we've, there are some issues that we've just kind of 
pushed to the side and they, they do need to be addressed. And, and, and certainly uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, those programs need to be evaluated and they're bigger than just marine fisheries. Uh, uh, certainly uh, DEP needs to be involved with a lot of that, but uh, uh, let's not conflate the two. Uh, PSP is uh, not, um, not, in this case, I don't believe NOSIT is uh, related to um, our human inputs. Um, I believe that the, the cysts have, uh, the cells have made it into NOSIT uh, from the Gulf of Maine, and now they've taken up residence. And so that, uh, that bloom that happens every year um, that is fed by the cold waters of the Gulf of Maine. Um, and it's just the particular uh, uh, perfect conditions. It's, uh, it's a small opening and yet it gets cold oceanic water. Those, uh, those cysts are now living there in the mud and they bloom every year. Um, uh, it, as far as a cause for the DSP I, uh, or ASP, it, that is unknown. So I, I, I caution us not to just assume that uh, um, our human inputs, our, our, our failing wastewater systems are, are causing the trouble. They, they, they probably aren't helping it, but uh, I don't think we have that data yet. Okay, I, I, fair enough. I appreciate the input. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, William. More questions for Jeff. Not seeing any further questions from the commission, Mr. Chair. Okay, we're going to move this along. Other business status of the subcommittees. Jared? Jared, are you handling this? I know Dan's got a. Uh, yeah, a no, go ahead, Jared. You, yeah, you sorry, I, I had to take myself off mute. So we have. Uh, Four outstanding subcommittees that were established over the past several months. Uh, the first uh, at the last meeting or two meetings ago, we, uh, we established the State Waters Groundfish Subcommittee in response to the April conditional closure. Um, and, and part of this is looking at um, yeah, how to increase access to the state water set aside while addressing issues regarding protected species and spawning closures. Um, we're, we're working on developing the data for this committee, and uh, we expect to convene a uh, subcommittee this fall for potential rule changes in 2022. Um, the Commercial Stripe Bass Subcommittee met last December. Um, we expect that we'll probably reconvene them this fall. Uh, while last December they looked at changes to the 2021 fishery uh, to provide additional access to the quota that the uh, the, the next meeting will focus on larger scale changes to the fishery to address access permitting and, and tagging. Um, we have the law enforcement subcommittee. Uh, they met last November and I expect we'll hold our annual meeting at roughly the same time this year. And uh, we had previously established a permitting subcommittee um, and we are still working to understand the scope of interest in this com committee and then we'll work to convene them um, once once we do that. So the, um, we'll staff will be reaching out directly to the members of that subcommittee to, to better understand the scope of, of what they intend to discuss. Um, the next item is the pandemic and the open meeting law. We um, have emergent in place right now are emergency provisions that um, that amended the open meeting law to allow for um, public meetings and public hearings to be conducted virtually. Um, an emergency order has been um, has ex this this emergency order has been extended through the end of the summer, uh, despite the COVID pandemic emergency order um, being lifted on June fifteenth. So. We will be meeting in August virtually. Uh, this gives you know public bodies the ability to continue to meet virtually, uh, while um, you know we we try to configure how in person meetings will be held moving forward. I expect our first in person meeting will likely be the September commission meeting, and then this fall um, we're expecting there will be some legislation to permanently adjust the open meeting law to allow for the continual the continuation of virtual meetings and, and virtual hearings. 
I have no idea what that's going to look like. Uh, Melanie touched on this in her comments um, that, you know, that it, there, there's some, you know, in-person meetings and virtual meetings seem to work well. A hybrid model is being considered. I'm not sure if that's a hybrid model that will allow um, virtual meetings to continue in a full virtual format or if it's a hybrid in-person virtual meeting format because that latter comes with some some uh, technical difficulties that we would have to address if that's something we would go, if that's a route we wanted to go down. But ultimately, I think that would be at the discretion of the commission as to how much we want to accommodate a hybrid model, um, provided it works within the, the framework of the law. And then the last aspect here is the, the upcoming MFAC meeting dates. Uh, I've spoken with the director and the, and the chair and the vice chair. We've highlighted these four dates for the second half of 2021. On August 19th, we'll meet virtually via Zoom. Um, then we'll meet again on September 23rd, October 28th, and December 2nd at locations to be determined. I imagine all three of those meetings will be in person. Um, so those are our comments on other business. I could take any questions on any of those three items. Questions? I'm not seeing any further questions on this, Mr. Chair. I'll bring the agenda back up. Okay, commission member comments. We'll start with Khalil. No comments, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Suki? I'm all sorry. Bill Doyle? Bill? Doyle? All right, we'll move this along. Shelly Edmondson? No comments. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Michael Pierre Nock? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few words, uh, a few things that are going on. Uh, it's been a busy few weeks at the HMSN. <clears throat> there are proposed restricted fishing days for commercial bluefin tuna fishing. Those comments are due in to uh, NOAA by June 11th. The, there is an e, a proposed ESA designation for short fin mako. Those comments are due in to NOAA by June 14th. And Amendment 13 associated with bluefin tuna uh, has comments that are out there that are due July 20th. Uh, there's been ongoing meetings uh, concerning wind turbines of which uh, we mentioned earlier and, uh, with Orsted and others. And once again, I thank DMF for uh, helping to facilitate that and, and get the, the details to the developers of our, to uh, assist us in, in detailing the use of uh, those areas by us. Thank you. Lou Williams. Yeah, all set, right? Thanks. Yeah, did I miss anybody, Jared? I'd like to wish everybody a uh, safe and safe and productive summer, and have some fun. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and once again, I just want to thank commission members for their attendance record. This is it's it's. I can't put words to it, and for your engagement. At that, I uh, have to move to public comment. Eric Lorenzen, you've been you recognized. Uh, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Eric. All right. I uh, just wanted to make myself known if anybody had questions. I'm the uh, hall singer that asked to get Fridays in the city and uh, was looking to get Fridays in the city to save myself on time and distance because I wasn't allowed in the cities on Fridays. I would have to go to Salem where there was a concentration of other sane boats that were all competing for the same fish or I would have to go down to Plymouth and some comes, sometimes come back empty handed and that would add four to six hours to my day. So I was just hoping to shorten my day and I hear everybody's concerns and uh, I'll you know, I, I'm well aware of the uh, eyes that are upon me while fishing in the city. And, you know, I do my due diligence and try my best to keep the peace. And I just wanted to make myself known if anybody had from the commission or anything had any questions that they had for me. 
Questions for Howard from commission members. Not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, Eric, for participating and listening to a commission meeting. I certainly okay. appreciate it, and I'm sure the other commission members appreciate it. Thank you very much. I uh, one, one last thing is I I have control of my own operation. I just I don't have control over other operations in the city, and that is just one of my concerns. If somebody else comes in there and they get you know they get taunted into something creating an issue i can only i can only control myself and my operation and that's my worry is if there's fish nowhere else but in the city then uh, if there's a concentration of the other boats coming in there it could you know create uh some heat well i do believe that's been the concern of uh different commission members uh you come through with a great reputation and you got the Mass Strike Bass Association endorsement. But I think the concern is just what you stated, that if you get a bad actor coming in there, uh, you know, you also heard Dan and how commission members responded to an immediate closure. So I wish you the best of luck with that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Beth Cassoni, you're recognized. Thank you, Jared. Um, thank you for letting me comment. I had a question. Is there going to be a memo or an advisory that will go out to the commercial fishing industry on the CARES Act 2.0 timeline? I know we talked about it on our last call last week. And I haven't seen anything yet, and I've been getting a few phone calls. Thank you. Yeah, Beth, that's a good question. This is Dan. Um, what we'll do is when we submit that, um, maybe what we'll do is we'll post it to our website that the application's been submitted to NOAA and we're awaiting approval. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's a good point because All right, good. if people are completely in the dark, uh, they should they need to know like where we're at in the application process. Okay. So thanks for that. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Beth. Anybody else from the public, Jared? There are no further members of the public who would like to speak at this time. We can move for a motion to adjourn. Uh, please, somebody make a motion to adjourn. I need a, the motion and then a second. Good enough, motion to adjourn. Thank you, Michael. I need a second. Second. Seconded by Bill Doyle. And I presume there's no opposition to adjourning. Seeing no opposition. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation. And yep. thank EMF staff once again. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Commission.